ครับสวัสดีครับ Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our special event, Global Mindsets for Thailand 4.0, the minds and the practices organized by the Faculty of Liberal Arts, Thammasat University, together with our two partners, the Knowledge Network Institute of Thailand and Axon Global Publishing. My name is Natapon r i p o n t e a s a k the Director of ASEAN China International Studies. I will be your MC today. First of all, I would like to invite Assistant Professor Dr. Nitinan w i t s a w e s u n Vice Rector for Academic Affairs of t a m a s a t University, to give an opening speech. Please. I'm so sorry, I'm sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Dr. p a s i s a u s b o r k I'm very sorry. I'm not very good at pronunciation of um, Finnish uh, name. Um, the colleague from Faculty of Liberal Arts, also colleague from Education Sector, um, professors, uh, students, and everyone who are getting involved in educational development process. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to t h a m a s a t University. This is t a p r a j a n Campus. A number of you have been here, but uh, maybe some of you have come here for the first time. This is the first home of t h a m a s a t University. Looking at the atmosphere around here, we are located by the river. So, in terms of environment, I think we have created a very friendly environment for students and professors to perform better and better um, education um, improvement. Um, I like to express my deepest gratitude to all of you who have organized. This um, session on the global mindset for Thailand 4.0, the mind and practices. I think it's very critical time, particularly for Thailand, to have educational reform. If you have seen a number of young generations who have been struggling in a number of challenges in this world, of course they are now living. In the world of digital um, advancement, a number of times they get a lot of information, they can absorb a lot of things, but they haven't had enough awareness of what they should have comprehend or what they should have analyzed. Or even though they can an analyze, we're not sure whether they could deliver correct message. And later on, those message may be transmitted incorrectly. So education is very important um, ground for um, development for every um, society. So I'm very happy to see that there are a number of like-minded uh, people in education um, gathering here today. I also like to congratulate Finland. As the country of the role model of the education um, development in the world, I think we all admit that education system in Finland is highly contributing to the equality and the development of everyone. Particularly, it's equal for all. That's what we perceive, and so. This is a very perfect forum that all of us can learn from you. Um, particularly, if you have heard of the Finland education system, I think there are now a number of news uh, publicizing about education system in Finland, in Tha um, publicizing this in Thailand that children are spending relatively less time in classrooms. Or on the uh, contents, but it tremendously contributes to enhancing students' potential. I think that's the key message: how you can enhance students' uh, potential, so that we can benefit from their potentials in the development of society. 
So this key of success are highly valued for all of us to learn. And Thomas Art University has um, tried to emphasize, uh, our, try to focus our curriculum on developing and improving potentials. It's not only the um, lectures, not only examinations that students can pass, but how we can gather and improve the potentials of, of students. So this is a perfect time, I think, for all of us to, to join the session. Um, Dr. Parsi always said, this is what I learned, that I think you have said in a number of um, occasions, do not try this at home. That is a golden message from you. Um, do not try this at home is something that um, I'm very interested in, and I think it's surprisingly amazing. Because sometimes we like to copy, I would say that. We see that there are a number of things that are good in some places, and so we try to copy. Or even though we use a better word, we learn. We learn lessons. But anyway, do not try this at home. It's a kind of warning message. But still, it's a message of thought that provokes all of us to see how we can try this if we want to try. And so this is a good time that when we learn from Dr. Parsi what we can do, what we should avoid, and then we can be successful in having uh, the adapted model into our society. I think we all have the same inspiration and we are confident that we can move this forward together. So without further ado, I would like to extend my special thanks to our two partners as well from the Knowledge Network Institute of Thailand, Associate Professor Dr. Piradet Tong Ampai, and also the Axon Global Publishing, Mr. Tawan Teva Axon. So um, this talk wouldn't be possible without the two of you. So I, on behalf of Thomas Art University, I would like to see that this forum can bring about a number of fruitful issues, uh, constructive comments, and so we can finally contribute to the so-called Thailand 4.0, mm -hmm. which we may still at the some time, at some point, we may have doubt what it is, what we can do. <laughs> but anyway, mm -hmm. this is a good time. Thanks to Faculty of Liberal Arts as well for your hard working your best efforts in um, contributing to this forum. Once again, on behalf of Thomas Art University, welcome all of you, and I wish you a pleasant stay in Bangkok and Thomas Art University. Thank you. Thank you so much. Assistant Professor Dr. Nitinan. Next, I would like to invite Associate Professor Dr. Piradet Tongampai, the Director of the Knowledge Network Institute of Thailand, to give a speech on the importance of education and its path to Thailand 4.0, please. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and especially our guest speakers today, yeah, I would like to uh, thank uh, uh, the Embassy of Finland that to provide us a very strong support for, for these events too. Uh, as you know, maybe I, I, will, I, I will not say that uh, ed education is important, but uh, to move toward the Thailand 4.0. That is, uh, we would like to base on our innovation and knowledge that we create in our country or by the Thai people. But it will not succeed if our people do not 
go with us. And uh, one thing I think that uh, education is a very uh, serious and uh, very important part to uh, have this uh, opportunity to be a success. And uh, one thing that all you may know that the uh, Finnish education system maybe is the best in the world. So in this uh, opportunity, we have a good, uh, we maybe we can say that we have a best speaker in, uh, in this area because, uh, you know, Dr. Pasi wrote a book you know that this one uh, finished lesson 2.0 or maybe 4.0 uh, okay this one uh, has been tra uh, translated in thai so if you read it you may learn that uh, the system or the the thinking about the finnish education is quite different from the uh, United States or some countries and also in Thailand. But uh, as uh, the Dean speak about, uh, we cannot copy all those to apply to our country. But, you know, after this session, when we uh, listen to or we share the knowledge with uh, Dr. Parsi and uh, our guest speaker, Tina and Eli, I think that uh, we will analyze that uh, what should be done in Thailand. That is the very important part. Yeah, I don't think that uh, we can apply it all that uh, wrote in this book to our, 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 this, our system. But anyway, we have to change. If we don't change our um, method of uh, doing, it's not uh, development will happen. Okay, yeah, but uh, Dr. Parsi has a very short time today because uh, he has a meeting after this. So I will not spend our time yeah, to share the knowledge with him. Maybe I think it's time to give uh, him the opportunity to express or to uh, share the knowledge that you have uh, plenty to us. And then we maybe if we have a chance to uh, share the knowledge together, it should be good. So uh, thank you again uh, to all of our, our guest speaker and also the Embassy of Finland. Thank you. Thank you so much, Associate Professor Dr. Peter Dale. Next, uh, we have Dr. Pasi Selber, who is a Finnish educator, author, and scholar. He has worked as a school teacher, teacher educator, researcher, and policy advisor in Finland, and has examined education systems around the world. His expertise includes school improvement, international education issues, classroom teaching and learning, teacher education, and school leadership. He is also the author of bestseller book, Finnish Lessons 2.0. What can the world learn from educo educational change in Finland and other numerous professional articles and book chapters? And today he will give a talk on to teach or not to teach. So uh, unfortunately, he will have another meeting after this. So we will save the Q&A session uh, at around two until around four. I think he will come back again. So please give Dr. Selber a big round of applause, please. Thank you very much. How are you? You're good? Is English is okay? English is Finnish. Yeah, it's wonderful to be here. I, I really appreciate all these um, introductions. I, I think both of the speakers before me really got very quickly to the essence of what we are trying to do here with you. And it's, it's certainly, we are not here, any of us. I'm very happy to have Elisa and Tina here. Uh, joining this uh, this afternoon with you and none of us is here to, to try to tell you that you should do what Finland has done and everything will be fine. We are we are trying to inspire you and, and share some of the knowledge and experiences that we have and just like you heard before that then it's up to you to decide what you have to do. I have studied your Thailand 4.0 strategy. It's a very ambitious and, and you know, if you if you go through carefully all of those things, you immediately conclude that hey, education is a is a critical part of this thing. You can you cannot be successful without really 
rethinking education here. Not just doing something, but you have to really rethink many of the things um, that are required to um, accomplish the ambitious and necessary dream that you have set for yourself. And as soon as you start to think about education, you also realize that there's one aspect of education that is particularly important, and that's something that we are going to discuss here this afternoon with you, that is a teacher, what type of teachers we need um, to do all, all these things that we are planning to do. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak a little bit about that first, kind of I introduce you to, the, uh, to this team from the global point of view, and then my colleagues here will lead you to um, more practical aspects of of teachers and teaching, but that's something that everybody, you know, all the education systems around the world right now are thinking about the same thing, that what is teaching, what it is to be a teacher, how should we prepare them, what do they need to know and be able to do, uh, what should their workplaces look like. Every country, Finland and Singapore and China, all around the world, the same questions are there. So that's why we are not alone here, so we need to think about this. and. Um, Thank you for mentioning my, my book. I'm very proud of having finished lessons 2.0 in Thai. Uh, personally, it's a, it's a number 26 uh, in the language-wise editions. And I must tell you one thing, it's, a, it's my favorite outlook. The cover is really beautiful. So I carry the Finnish, Thai version of Finnish lessons everywhere I go here. And you know what happens often when I laid on the table on the coffee shop, and just when I'm leaving, it's, the book is gone. <laughs> And I don't know whether it's because people here in Thailand, whether they think that they will, they will learn Finnish language <laughs> or whether they are interested in Finnish education system. But that's a, it's, a very important, uh, it's a very important book for me. And, um, and as you heard from the vice rector, I, I always emphasize that don't, don't, try, don't try these things at home without being absolutely sure that you understand what you're doing. And that's the same thing with all those advertisements and commercials when they say that don't try at home. Of course, you can try it if you absolutely clear what the consequences may be and this is exactly the same okay so i'm going to i'm going to speak a little bit about this this kind of a critical question of you know how do we get more young people into teaching am i right when i say that this is one of the challenges here in thailand is to find more get more people interested in teaching in the school is it correct or you have enough te good teachers no that's what I hear everywhere. You know, it's the same thing in most countries. There are very few countries that would say, yeah, we have a good situation because we have so many young people who want to teach in the school that we can only take part of them. Okay? Uh, Singapore is one of those. Uh, Finland is one of those. Ireland, Republic of Ireland is one of those. But there are not too many places in the world where more people, young people want to become teachers than there are seats in the labor market. Okay, so most countries have the opposite, that there's, there are not enough, enough um, youngsters who kind of think that education is a good career, it's something worth trying. Okay, so that's why the world looks very different from that point of view. You know what I decided to do? I, uh, rather than just, you know, talk to you, I tried to do something that good teachers would probably do in this situation, you know? It's not a good teaching anymore to, to stand here and talk to you 45 minutes about stuff. So I try to engage you a little bit in the beginning to think about the teaching. What do you think about the teaching and the role of teachers and the power of teachers um, in general, right? Are you ready for this? Because I'm going to give you three questions. And when you see, this is not a really a question, this is a statement. So these are the arguments or statements that you can easily find in a literature if you read about teachers and teaching profession in different countries. So, th so these are three examples of the important statements or claims. And what I'm asking you to do, when you see the this uh, displayed here, read it carefully and read it twice, because these are not straightforward things at all. And then I, I ask you the simple thing, to decide whether you think that this is a fact or it's a myth. Or in America they say it's an alternative fact. <laughs> in Finland we say that it's a lie. <laughs> so when, you, when I show you these three things, I'm going to show them to you one at a time. Read it carefully and then make up your mind whether you think that this is true or not. And sometimes I know that you can say it's, it can be this or it can be that, but that's not the right answer here. You have to decide that I think that it's more of a fact or more of a myth. And when you have decided, 
turn to the person who is sitting next to you and say that I think that this statement is myth or lie because blah blah blah. Okay, and this is not going to take too long. So we, I just try to wake you up a little bit to think about some of these things that you probably thought are obvious. So I'm going to tell you what these are. Are you ready for this? Yes. No, I mean, are you ready for this? Yes. Are you ready for this? Yes. Yeah, okay, much better than this. Okay, the first one is something like this. I read it for you if you cannot see it over there. This says that the most important single factor in improving quality of education is teachers. Okay, I read it again. The most important single factor in improving quality of education is teachers. Think about this. Is it a myth or is it a fact? When you have made up your mind, turn to the neighbor and say, what do you think? Do it now, for half a minute, no more, very quickly. Okay, it's a difficult one, right? Now I'm going to ask you. Um, now I'm going to ask you if you, if you th think that this is more of a fact, if you think that this is fact or close to be true, raise your hand up now. Uh, look around a little bit. T take a look what the other people are thinking. Okay, so there are quite a number of hands now. If you think that this is uh, more of a myth than fact, raise your hand. There are more. Okay, so this, in this case, let's see if, whether you are winning. It is a myth. <laughs> it's not true. And you, you know, this is a very significant statement because if you believe, if you think that this is true, let's say that you are minister or authority who has power to influence in policies and reforms. If you firmly believe that this is the thing, then true, then, then of course you do things that will put a lot of weight and expectations to teachers, okay? And you are probably in favor of looking for policies and solutions that will bring somehow better people into teaching, right? But take a look at this. So if you ask the, the question, that, so how do we, what do we know about this? What do we know about how important teachers actually are for the quality of education? One of the most convincing uh, evidences uh, comes from a very trusted and, and prestigious organization called American Statistical Association that is a, um, a nonpartisan um, public entity that found a couple of years ago that most studies regarding the, the, the uh, effectiveness of teaching, find that teachers account for about 1 to 14% of the variability of test scores. So teachers have a very minor um, influence, actually it's a big one, but it's a minor compared to many other things when it comes to what kids are, children are actually learning in school. Are you surprised? Many people are, they say that so teachers don't make any difference. It's, it's not that. First of all, this is a statistical thing. So there are different types of teachers and situations. But overall, this is what the research shows. Okay. So what is, what is the biggest factor? Let's go back to this because it's a, it's a tricky one. It says that what is the, uh, the most important single factor? It doesn't say where this factor should be. So what do you think is, is the biggest factor in explaining what children learn in school if it's not the teacher? What's that? Learners. But learner, uh, yeah, okay. It's, yeah, it's not, if you, if you learn, I mean, students, it's not really, it's not really a student alone. Student factors are significant, but they're not the biggest one. Nope. Think about it. What explains mostly what kids learn in school? Where they come from, right? Family background. It's about 60%, two-thirds of the, the variability of students' learnings in different studies around the world is about parents, their education, their occupations, their wealth, their structure, the language they speak at home, many other things. Two-thirds, okay? 
And then the rest, one third, is about teachers, school principals, curriculum, the learners, the different characteristics. So we have to keep this in mind when we think about the policies and what to do. The teachers are important, but we cannot say that teachers can change everything. That just by having great teachers in your schools, everything would be fine. Because, you know, if two thirds come from outside of the school, we have to do something to those things that children have when they are not in school. Okay, help parents and families and many other things that Finland has been very successful with for, for many years. Okay, are you, are you disappointed? <laughs> a little bit, particularly those who say that this is a fact. But don't worry, you can, you're going to be right next time. <laughs> this is the second one. Okay, now this is a little bit longer one and, and think carefully. This says that low ability teachers, whatever it means, maybe it's an unexperienced or teachers are not, not able to do that well. Low ability teachers perform as well as teachers of average ability if they have strong social capital in their school. And social capital here means that, basically it means that if teachers collaborate, if they have access and opportunity to, to be linked to their colleagues in their own school and other schools. So the argument is that these low ability teachers perform as well as teachers of average ability if they have social capital in a school. Think about this, make up your mind whether this is a fact or myth, turn to your neighbor and then tell what you think. One minute for this. <laughs> And remember, this is pretty much how Finnish teachers always work in a classroom, that we ask uh, students to talk a little bit and, you know, tell what they think. So you have to do that. You have to follow, follow us now, right? Okay, very good. Are you ready? Okay, raise your hand now. Raise your hand if you think that this is this is a fact. It's true. Raise your hand. Look around. Okay, most people. Raise your hand if you think that this is a myth. Some people, okay? Now I have to disappoint some people because this is a fact. And, and you know, this is something that we have just uh, recently learned to understand through research. Previously, there was not much research that was really looking at what the power of teacher collaboration in the schools. It was more about individual, the role of human capital, you know, how could education teachers have and whether the fact that they have master's degree or bachelor's degree really have any influence in the quality of what they do. Only recently, the, the last 10 years, or last five years really, we have had more evidence of the power of social capital. Basically, this, this means that if we have a school where teachers, through leadership, are linked to one another and actually not only encouraged but required to work together and help one another and join the associations and networks with other teachers, that these teachers, even if they are not the best teachers in the world, but they are able to be better, much better. And this research finding shows that they are going to, they are able to be as good as the average teachers are just by linking to one another, just by using, having access to other people. It's very, very important. Now the question is that if this is true, and this is Carrie Liana's research from, um, she's from Pittsburgh University, United States, and she's doing a wonderful job in trying to under help people to understand the power of social capital, kind of a social side of, of education. But if this is true, and it seems to be true, many people, increasing number of people are now inclining to this opinion that teaching is a kind of a social profession, it's a teamwork rather than individual race. The question is, what does it mean for teacher education? Should we still prepare teachers as we did before, in the lecture halls, individually, taking exams, having degrees, or should we do something else, if this is what they are assumed to do in the schools? And this is a very important message also for you here in Thailand, 
the, how do you get your teachers to collaborate more? How do you, how do you install, increase the culture of collaboration in your schools? rather than competition, that many teachers now feel that they are competing against their colleagues because they want their, their students to do better in the final examination than their colleagues. And it's a horrible situation, think about it. These good ideas may be in the same school if they were just shared and used collectively. So it's a very important thing. And before teachers can do anything like this, they have to be prepared that, for that. So teachers have to be trained and educated to collaborate and understand this. It's a very, very important thing. Are you disappointed with this? No, you are inspired, <laughs> right? There's a hope, finally. <laughs> Free of charge, doesn't cost too much. Okay, so now those who were twice wrong, <laughs> you still have one more chance to be right, okay? And this is the third one. Now, getting the best and the brightest to teach is the condition for teacher quality. Okay, let me read it again. Getting the best and the brightest young people to teach is the condition for teacher quality. Now, this is a difficult one. This is a hard one. It's the most difficult one of this all. Think about it. Now turn to your neighbor and say, what, do you think? what is your kind of first First response to this, fact or myth? Okay, now, now if you think that this is true, if you think that the, the best and the brightest is a good best strategy and condition for improving teacher quality, raise your hand up now. Hey, come on, people. There's one hand, two. What do you say? Whether this is true, raise your hand if you think that this is true. Raise your hand up. Okay, we have one people, one person. We used to have two. Okay, we have two. Thank you so much. Raise your hand if you think that this is not true. I'm very sorry you're alone here. But don't feel bad. It's okay. It's all right. Because most of the people are right with this. This is a myth. Okay. Okay. Of course, it thinks a little bit how you read this thing, but but in in general, you know, most many countries now believe that the key to the teacher issue and the teacher challenge is to find change the policies or find the the programs or projects that will bring so-called best and brightest into teaching. Okay. So how do we get the the um, People, young people graduating from the best universities here to choose teaching. You don't. That's, that's, a, that's an illusion. And it's also an illusion because this assumes that teacher quality goes hand in hand with the academic talent. Okay? That the teacher quality would somehow be associated to how smart you are academically. And there's no evidence for that. Think about your own teachers in the school. Sometimes I had a teacher who was a, he was probably the master in his subject, but he was a horrible teacher. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't understand at all how we learn those things, okay? Horrible teacher. And then you may have somebody who doesn't know everything, the teacher who often says, that, I really don't know this, or I don't remember but it's a wonderful person to teach, helping people to exceed and, and excel themselves. So we have to be very careful with this one. And this is where I have a little, this kind of a siding here to Finland, because Finland is a, is a very particular place in this respect. You know, we are one of those countries where we have many more young people seeking for becoming teachers than we can actually accept. It's a very particular situation. It's a good situation because we can, we have to every year choose, select carefully who will be the lucky ones who will become teachers. Okay? And let me show you something. You often, you probably heard, if you have read anything about Finnish education, that there are 10 times more applicants into teacher education in primary school teacher education than we have seats in the universities, right? And then, of course, the conclusion is that if you have 10 times more 
places to study, then you take the, the best 10%, right? You just select the, the, the best and the brightest, the smartest people into teaching. We could do that. Now, take a look at this. This will show you roughly the, the line of number of applicants every year in and all, all our teacher education programs within primary school teacher preparation. Okay, So it has been increasing, and now it's leveled somewhere about 8,000, between eight and 9,000 9, applicants a year. We are 6 million people, so 9,000 young people every year who want to apply to primary school teacher education is a lot. It's a big number. And Every year we take about 800, okay? So that's about 10%. And then of course the conclusion is that, so you're lucky ones, you can get the, you can choose the, just select the best 10%. But now, here I say always people, okay, wait a minute, how do you know that? How do you know that these 800 that I selected are definitely those who have the highest test scores in a final school living examination. Let's take a look at this and I'll show you something very interesting that raises many questions about how we should be doing this. This is an example of, we have eight research universities in Finland where teachers, uh, primary school teachers are prepared. They all require a master's degree from the teacher, so it's, it's normally, well you know it's much better than I do, it's about five or six years of study, right? It's a full-time program and you do your thesis and research and you know all those things regardless of where do you go. It's the same thing in all, all of these universities. But here you will see the, um, you don't see this properly, but th this line here is, um, uh, is, is the distribution of academic talent of those who applied and actually were accepted uh, to the University of Helsinki, that is the biggest program. Okay, so if you have, here are the students who have very low points, exam points in a matriculation examination that is a high school, um, high school leaving examination in Finland. So the, these students here, if you have students here, they are, they are not doing very well at all in the final examination, meaning that their academic scores are not really that good. Those students that are here between 81 and 100 points, those are those smart kids academically who have been doing very well in examination and probably also very well in the school. Now, and here you see the percentage of the students. So we're going to see the distribution here, how the accepted students, academic, the talent distribution looks like. Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. So now, if you think that the, the Finnish universities are selecting the best and the brightest, then of course the, you should have the distribution something like this here, right? Those are the best and the brightest. Um, oh, let me show you this first, because the, you need to know how many students, how many applicants there were. Uh, three years ago, Helsinki University of Helsinki had 2,300 applicants, huge number, to one program that only accepts 120. Tough competition. It's tougher to get into primary school teacher education program than to study law or medicine in Finland if you look at the numbers, the, the intake numbers, okay? So, you know, the question often is that, so what happens to those kids who are not successful? Because there are many thousands. They go somewhere else, they go and study law <laughs> and medicine. <laughs> you know, I, was, I spent three years teaching at Harvard University. That is a small uh, private college university in the United States. I don't know if you have heard about Harvard really have. Anyway, I was there teaching my students and uh, once I gave a presentation about this thing and I said that I belong to those, I was one of those students who, who tried twice to get into this program and I failed twice. So I was not good enough to become a primary school teacher in Finland. So I became a lecturer, a professor at Harvard University instead. <laughs> My Harvard colleagues didn't like that, but students found it quite entertaining. Anyway, we have a lot of stories about people who were not, not smart, good enough to become teachers in Finnish schools, and they ended up doing something, something interesting itself. So this is a distribution. Look at this. It's nothing that would kind of allow any, any evidence, any support for the argument that this university would be, or any other university in Finland would be just selecting, looking at the, the best and the brightest people, that we, we have a very particular way of selecting. 
only one quarter of the accepted students are so-called good students, academically strong students, okay? One quarter of the students are what would be in many cases considered as not so good student or poor. I wouldn't say bad student because there's no such thing as bad student, but they were not very good in academic stuff, at least as far as the examination is concerned. And most of the students in, in this program, this cohort, are just the regular, just the average, close to the average normal academically. Now, of course, if this is true, then the question is, particularly here, that why this university is accepting so many, in this case, about 30. 30 students who have questionable examination results academically. What do you think the answer is to this question? The why university is interested in accepting these when they could easily take those who have very high scores in math and science and literature and those things. What do you think? Who are these? Now think about an example, one, one young woman or man from here, from this block, who was accepted three years ago, what would likely be his or her background and reason why, why she's there? Good question, right? Yeah. Well, perhaps uh, because the applicants of this group understand and care about their students because or perhaps because they come from the same background as their students. Very good. They, they have something that they understand what the students need. What do you think they could have done instead of going to school or doing well in school? You know, the good example in, in, in the Finnish case is, and, and my colleagues here, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm completely wrong, but if you have somebody who has a sports or athlete background, okay, like I was, you know, I was one of those. I was doing all sorts of other things but schooling because I found them much more interesting. I had a rock and roll band. I was singer, as you see. It's a little bit like this. <laughs> Just missed the band. And I was doing sports. I was playing sports and I was a coach for kids for many years while I went to school. That's why I didn't have time to school because I found those things interesting. But when I go to, the, if I go to apply, and this didn't help me much, but if, if I was smart, I would use this as a kind of my asset. I said, I know, I know how to work with young people. As a coach, football coach, I know how to make young boys to do things that they sometimes say that, do I have to do this? Like, run three kilometers in the rain. I said, yes, you have to do that because you know, this, is a, this is a team, okay? And I, I know how to get people to do these things. If you have people like this applying to, into teacher education and they can explain their, their theory and method and philosophy of coaching and teaching and working with young people, I think it's much more powerful than somebody saying that I have the high score in mathematics, take me. That doesn't tell anything about whether you understand things like what you were saying. So that's what I'm trying to tell you here is that it's very important how we select people into the teaching profession. It's very important. And most countries don't pay any attention to this. They just think that if you're good in academically, we're going to make a good teacher out of you. And that's where the problems often begin. Do you agree with me? Yeah, and you understand what I'm saying. Wonderful. Okay, very good. So that's the, uh, that's the thing. Let me show you a little clip. I don't have too much time here, but I'm going to show you just a little bit um, what the Finnish teacher training school looks like. And you're probably going to talk more about the details of the um, uh, things behind the, the training and learning and, and being a teacher in Finland. But it's just for you to, you can fasten your seat belts and uh, I'm not going to show you the whole, this is about 10 minute clip, it's just a couple of minutes so that you can see a little bit, you know, how the process of preparing this new type of teachers in Finland uh, looks like. It's very much like clinical training in your teaching hospitals, you know, when you become a medical doctor. You spend quite a bit of time in a, in a teaching hospital with the experienced medical doctors and you learn by the bed, the bedside, and then understand, you know, how the process looks like. We do exactly the same similar things with our teachers. The, our students spend a lot of time in a clinical teacher training schools where they can, they can see how teachers teach and what, what is happening in a classroom and they learn to understand the process of teaching and learning in a different way. So it's a very 
peculiar thing. So just to give you a little time to relax, and then I close in a couple of minutes to to uh, give you a few things to to think about. So let's take a look. At Apprentice School, our task is to combine theory and practice. The main duties are uh, teaching the children and training student teachers. So it's kind of an adventure every day. When Finland was entering the 1970s, we had a, we had a system me. that was dividing pupils, students in the two different pathways. And we thought that this is not the best way to provide a good education for all of our children in a small uh, nation like Finland. We decided to do those pathways away and have instead a one comprehensive or unified nine-year uh, compulsory education a school system and, and a clear understanding very soon was that if we want this new system to work we need to have different type of teachers the proposal was that primary school teachers should be educated in our research universities and each of these research universities they all also run what we call teacher training schools For me, a practice school is a place where I can I can try my skills in teaching in a safe atmosphere, and I can trust that no one is judging me or anything. And I think this is a really safe environment to try try your teaching because I haven't really done any work with like eight year old kids before. <laughs> From community perspective, a practice school gives basic education from kindergarten to grade 12. Ihan tavallinen koulu, jossa harjoittelijat opiskelevat, mutta muuten se ei muista koulusta. The practice school is also a part, it's one unit of University of Helsinki. And as such, it is the place that houses teacher training, all future teachers who study at the University of Helsinki also do their practice here. The clinical practical training for the primary school teachers is about 50 to 20 percent out of the entire five-year decree. <laughs> Okay, and the story goes on. So this is the, uh, all, all our universities where teachers are prepared have a similar type of school. And what, what you see, um, you know, if you have an opportunity to walk into any of those schools or any school in Finland, what you see is a, is a very calm atmosphere. You know, people, are teachers are not rushing around and kids are not really running from one class to another. That's like, like in this one, you see that it's a very calm and relaxed and informal way of uh, doing these things. But I think what you should take away from this example is that, that sometimes people say that it's a good idea that all teachers have a master's degree. And I think it might be a good idea. But I think the more important thing is to think about what teachers should actually study, what this master's degree should be all about. Okay, you know, studying just more of the things that don't really mean too much for the teaching in the classroom or working in a school doesn't make any sense. But, you know, having a master's degree like this, where the students are spending a lot of time in, in a practice, in a school, in a real situation, and not alone, not just teaching alone, like in many countries when teachers do, students do practice, they are, they are left completely alone in a classroom. And just like a substitute teachers, you know, do their work alone. In Finland, we never do that. It's always, it's always a kind of a clinical process where experienced teachers and supervisors are helping these students to understand what is going on, just like in this, uh, this case. Okay, let me give you five of my proposals that I think the, the globally, if we think internationally, what it takes to uplift the teaching profession to the next level. Um, in Thailand, you could call it the teaching profession 4.0. Of course, somebody would ask you that 
so what are the previous three and two and one? <laughs> But nevertheless, but this is, these are some of the themes that themes that you you could kind of kind of keep with you in your conversations when you when you continue the journey from here to think about um, how, how to respond to all of those challenges. I think the first really critical one, and this is something that should engage and include a wider society. You know, people from the businesses and academia, other other fields of study, is that the conversation that is teaching really a profession or not. So is it a profession akin to medical practice or law or engineering or architecture and design? Or is it more like a craft, something that requires much less training and something that is more a kind of a mechanistic technical practice or, or act? You know, doing something that somebody has asked you to do. Just like when you fix the car, you don't use too much creativity there. Right, that you, you need you do what you need to do there to get the car running. That the, is teaching the same type of thing that you just follow the manual and go and do the thing. Or is it more like a design or like a like a medical practice where you have to solve problems and think, use theories and knowledge uh, and one another colleagues to uh, to work on. You know all these high professions today. They are all collective, kind of a, a collaborative things. Lawyers never really work alone. Although, if you have to ever see a lawyer, you normally can afford just one one lawyer. <laughs> but these people never work alone. When they leave you, they go and they have a team to work these things. If you go and have an open heart surgery, it's not done by one person. There are a lot of people there. They do teamwork and they very carefully talk about what to do. But teaching is, uh, in most cases, teaching is still a kind of a lonely thing that one person does you never talk teachers never talk about what they do or what they should do with anybody else and afterwards they have nobody to talk to about what happened in the classroom so we have to change those things and really have a new conversation about the, what it means that teaching is a profession i think it's very important for you to be able to argue why teaching should be a profession what makes a profession it's not a simple answer at all it takes a lot of thinking and and um, consideration. But the conclusion should be that, yes, teaching is a profession, and that's why we need certain things. That's why teachers need a continuous professional learning and development. It's not enough that you get your training initially, and then you teach your 30 years and retire. It doesn't happen like this anymore. So this, I think, is a critical starting point for any teacher, um, teacher reform or uplifting of, of teaching anywhere, including Finland as well. Then the second one is that I, I think we need, really need to think about this decrease at the university, what type of uh, programs we are offering to teachers when they first go and study to be, become teachers. My argument here is that these decrees have to be attractive. They have to be so attractive to these young people here that they say that this looks to me, seems to me so interesting program that I, I go and do this rather than anything else. But I can tell you one thing, the, the teacher programs that we have now in many places, including Finland, are not really doing this. There's a lot of old fashioned stuff there and a lot of things that kids have done already in the school. And they, most of these programs have nothing or very little about things that the teachers really need, like teamwork skills, you know, how to collaborate, how to learn how to, how to run and, and be effective team members. Very few teacher programs have those things. Or leadership. Learn to understand how you lead a class or how you lead a project in your school or something like this. Or technology. You know, what, is, what is the role, role of technology in learning in general, not only in, in a classroom? I think these attractive degrees have to in, include many of those components that the young people would say that this is so interesting and maybe useful also for other careers. If I don't want to teach all my life, I can use these, these areas of the program to do something else. So not just education and pedagogy and curriculum and content. We need to think pr more broadly about what young people need to be good, successful teachers. And then I, I would insist a what, what we call a collective autonomy um, as part of the teaching practice. The collective autonomy means that Teachers should be less dependent, or in other words, they should be more autonomous from the bureaucracy, from the authorities 
in the school, but less dependent on one another. Okay? So sometimes people, when they are insisting teacher autonomy, they say the teachers should be able to do whatever they want to do. I, I don't think that is a good idea. I think this collective autonomy that calls for less dependency from the bureaucracy, but more dependency from one another is a thing, is a way forward. And this is all about leadership, this is all about regulations and policies that will view teaching as a collective, collaborative profession. But the decision making regarding how to do that and what happens in the school should be to, as much as possible, to be left, to be decided by these teachers. Um, otherwise, it's going to be very difficult if, you, if your system here develops, continue, continues to develop in a way that teachers feel that I have nothing to say about how to teach or what's going on in my school is, is not a good idea in the long run. Then the fourth one is what we call a professional capital, enhancing professional capital in schools. And professional capital is something, it's probably a new term, you haven't maybe heard about that too much, but professional capital is something that includes several dimensions of capitals, or competencies, or capacities. One of them is human capital, of course. Everybody knows human capital. That means what teacher knows and is able to do. That's a human capital. And that's what we are very good at. We have been very good at enhancing, increasing human capital of teachers and leaders by giving them training and knowledge and courses and degrees. The second dimension of the professional capital is social capital that I mentioned earlier. This is something that is means about how much value you can draw to your work from your networks, from collaboration, your social connections to other teachers, your colleagues um, in other countries or in other schools. And you, you learned earlier that more social capital we have in our schools, the better the quality of teaching will be, according to the research. And then there are other things like decisional capital that relates to teachers' decision making and how through giving teachers agency to influence what they do in the school is enhancing what they do. And, and all these, these dimensions together create more professional capital. If you want to read more about this, this is the, the idea first put forward by, by my colleagues Andy Harkris and Michael Fullen. And there's a book called, a great book called Professional Development that will explain why this is important in detail. And finally, I think we need a competitive pay for teachers. And this is a question that is always asked, how much teachers earn in Finland? Are they very well paid because they want to become teachers? And I said, no, they're not that good paid, but they're not very poorly paid either. I think we pay out, pay out teachers about the amount that is, you know, keeps them happy. But the, the pay has to be competitive to the point that we should minimize the number of those people who say that I would really love to be a teacher, but it doesn't pay me enough. So I want, I, instead, I'm going to do something else that keeps me more money and income because my family needs that. If you have a system like this, then you have an issue there. But then we should avoid also the situation that some countries have, that there are people who say that, I want to become a teacher because the salary is so good, or the benefits. I can retire when I'm 48. <laughs> Don't do that either, because even if you could afford, because it's 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 uh, attracting into the profession people who are not who are not teaching because of their heart. They're teaching there because of their wallet, and that's not a good good thing. So, but that's something that is a is a difficult thing to talk about, but I think we have to raise this issue on the table at some point and say that so, if we want to have good teachers, if, if you are about to have the teachers who will be able to help you to create the Thailand 4.0, you need to pay them more. That's uh, it's a simple like this. Otherwise, otherwise the problems and challenges will continue. The, what is uh, competitive pay? That's another question. But you know that's that's what I wanted to tell you as a kind of an introduction. I don't know how this resonates to what you what you're gonna do. <laughs> but um, did this make any sense to you? Did you like what I had to say? Yes. Say yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> say no if you didn't. <laughs> okay. Uh, unfortunately, I have to be away for a moment. I'll come back here and we can have a conversation and uh, and continue with this. But before we before we move forward.
I think it's probably good to have a little small little break. Unless if there's if there's one or two quick questions, I can take one or two right now, and then we have a, just a couple of minutes stretching your legs and standing up a little bit before um, we move forward. Anybody wants to say anything or ask a question? Go ahead. I'll give you the mic so that you can introduce yourself and. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, sir. I am from Japan and I'm teaching Japanese at the Samsung University, a private university in Thailand. And I'm teaching, um, and, and you heard, uh, uh, mentioned about the social capital, right? In Japan, as you know, it's a facing the aged society. And we have a lot of senior citizens who wish to you know, collaborate with the teachers and uh, with the students. But the problem is that their you know, physical disability, they cannot go out. So we can use the online technique and then I connect the, my students to you know, talk, um, you know, the video chat and the talk experience to them. So I would like to know the capacity or, or the, uh, how to say the potential. How how much potential the senior student without any teacher's education can? Do you think they can be a teacher? Uh, absolutely, it's a great. Thank you so much for this question. Um, uh, it's a wonder, wonderful idea. And Japan is not alone. Many countries like Finland is one of those where we have a lot of very experienced teachers leaving the profession and going to the well-deserved uh, pension. And they, they leave with a lot of ideas and things that they have done and they have learned. And if we don't utilize those at all, if we just tell them goodbye, enjoy, that's not a very good idea at all. So your example of using technology um, in communication, you know, linking these experienced people, having networks, maybe inviting them to work together with teachers, just an absolutely beautiful idea. And we have to, we need to do those things more in, in all the countries. So remember, never think that the, even if somebody has been a teacher for 40 years and had her or his train, initial training in 1960s or 70s, that they wouldn't know anything. You know, often these experienced teachers know much more than we think, we young, young people, we young people think. Yeah? So, um, so that is a, thank you for this. It's a, it's a very, very important point to, to use those, um, those uh, hundreds of thousands of millions of uh, experienced educators who are there available and willing, willing to help them and, and, and um, support that engage them. Thank you. Anybody else? Yep. I'm Silapon from Thailand. I'm Silapon from Thailand Research Fund. Um, I think you might encounter this question afterwards during your stay in Thailand. See, our country has a population 10 times mm -hmm. as in Finland. Yes. And um, perhaps you have some experience um, giving consultancy to, to other countries that about this size and with encountering difficulties in improving their education system. And perhaps you have some recommendations for us in tackling things because the size of Finland, in fact, is about the size of Bangkok. Yeah, that's uh, right. That is a good, it's a good question. I, was, I came from Beijing a couple of days ago and I was uh, speaking, um, attending a meeting there in one district of Beijing. So not the city of Beijing, one district of Beijing, and the head of the district education board raised the same question and said that I'm leading a district that has more people than Finland. <laughs> <laughs> but the question was the same: that you know, how do you, if you, if you have ten times more people like you have here in Thailand in your country than we have, uh, how, how do you do that? First of all, I would say that don't think that the problem, the challenge, would be ten times. Um, more demanding. It's not like this. It's definitely it's more complicated and more complex to deal with the um, um, the larger units. Um, but that's I, I, I would I wouldn't see that this is the main problem. I think the the, the main challenge is that there are some things that are more important uh, before that. Um, but you know how to do that. <sighs> hmm. <laughs> If, if I was nasty, I would give this mic to Elise and say that you must have an answer to this, but <laughs> I'm a nice man, so I'm not going to put you in a situation a situation like that. But, you, you know, I, I think that you are inviting, you're asking about the, the kind of a broader thinking about the strategy, how to approach these things. And I, I don't think, first of all, I, I think it's, it will be very difficult here in Thailand to have everybody changing in the same pace uh, together as we were able to do in Finland, because this is smaller, or Singapore. You know, Singapore has one university training teachers, 
Uh, they have 400 schools there, 6 million people. Uh, but they can do these things like in a pace. Now we do that, next year we do that, and then it's, and Finland we did the same thing. But here I think you need to think about another type of strategy that may be politically more complicated to justify or, or create, but it would be something that you change, that you look for those who are ready to move on and, and, and improve things and go first, okay? It's, it's a little bit like in Finland we say that we, you know, we, in the fall when we go to the thin ice on the lake, our, our lakes get frozen, okay? So if, if, I have, if we are good friends with us, uh, you go first there uh, to the thin ice to see if it carries you or not. So we can, uh, or some people say that I love James, but you go first. <laughs> so but it's a, this is a little bit the same type of thing that I would offer something like this, that build a strategy where you have different phases and different uh, kind of a waves of change where people who are feel ready and districts or parts of the country who said that we are we have been thinking about this we want to go first and then let the others see they know what they do and what happens and then have a second wave and say that now the next wave will follow and join and make sure that everybody will have access to this type of movement i would i would much more like to see something like this happening just like china is doing you know china is a very good in this type of thing that they have some of these spearhead places like shanghai and beijing and some of the other places where they test and, and try these new things and then others will follow um, whether you will get everybody in the end of the day in part of this thing that's that's something i don't know but i think it's much better than the, the likelihood of success is bigger than having a strategy where you kind of assume that everybody will go the same way. That's probably not going to happen. That's my best answer to, to you. Thank you so much, people. I'll see you a little bit later, but now if you allow me to ask, invite people to stand up a little bit for a couple of minutes and meet a new friend and have a little chat and talk about did it make any sense to you what you heard and what are the things that you disagree? And then, but don't be more than more than three minutes uh, away, and then you will have a little bit more good stuff. Thank you so much. See you later. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay.
Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I will give you my card as well. So. Or maybe I will give you the longer version. So here is something of this and uh, here is Tina's and my business card. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. So, um, so we have a right. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back. And our next talk will be on global Finnish teacher. And this we will be joined by two speakers, Miss Tina Malste and Miss Alice Travaini. Tina is an experienced teacher and a pedagog pedagogical resource expert in the field of content and language, integrated learning, as well as a tutor to teachers students. She is well experienced in working in multi-professional teams in developing education, teaching practices, teachers' professional skills, curriculum, and classroom strategies. And then we have Alice, who is the director 
of Global Operations of Etu Cluster Finland. Her main responsibility is managing the global operations of the company and the work of Etu Cluster Finland experts in different partnership programs. So please give them a big round of applause. Thank you. Can you hear me in the back? Wow, this is loud. Uh, this is not a very typical kind of a classroom in a way because we have many students sitting in the front rows. <laughs> Quite often everybody goes to the back row and, and uh, people seem, seem to start filling in a, a lecture hall like this from the back rows, but, but uh, there were many volunteers this time to come to the front row as well, which we are so happy about. So good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you all here. It's a great honor as well, uh, because uh, to have the chance to collaborate with so many educational experts it is definitely a, a great honor. And uh, with a very humble mind, um, we are nominated to be experts here, but definitely there is a lot more expertise in, in front of us now, or in front of me right now, than, than in, in front of you. And we have to understand that, that uh, in order to get the best possible results, uh, the best idea is to share expertise and to try to learn together. And, and this is actually what we like to think in our Finnish classrooms, that uh, there is not one expert and 25 or 30 learners, but there are uh, 25 plus one learners and the expertise is shared and the experiences are shared and, and even the knowledge is shared at all times. And I very much want to emphasize that fact here as well. Um, I, or later we, uh, will continue from, in a way, from where Dr. Salvari, Salvari got. Um, we, we, we will continue talking about teachers and, and what it is to be a teacher. And we will focus on, on what it is to be a Finnish teacher, what we think Finnish teachers are, and what we want to educate our Finnish teachers towards. And uh, from, from our perspective, we also want to share our experiences with you, our global experiences with you. Because quite often we get the challenge, a very challenging question, question from our audience, wherever out of Finland we are, that, ah, oh yes, that works in Finland. That kind of a teacher, that kind of education, of course it works in Finland, because you're only five million, and, and because, because you're only a small country, and because there are so many applicants to the universities, and so on, so on. And it would be easy to answer that, yes, oh yes, it works in Finland, but, but we don't know how it works anywhere else. But we do know. Um, from the past, almost 10 years already, um, our organization, we've got experiences on how Finnish teachers actually work out of the Finnish context. What kind of experiences we have from the situations where actual Finnish teachers and teacher educators have been put to totally different kind of platforms, totally different kinds of settings. We will share uh, the winnings, but also we're going to share some challenges. And by that, also we want to share uh, the kind of uh, perspective with you that, that uh, there might be something in the way that we educate our teachers that, that could help some other educational systems to, to uh, flourish as well. By reading that, you, you get to think that, 
Wow, Dr. Salbari just gave us statements that in a way tell that is that a myth? Is is that a truth? Is that a fact? What is that? Uh, for me, that is a fact. For me, that is not a myth. Uh, we started our Finnish teacher education in the city of Uvascula, where we come from in 1863, exactly 154 years ago. Uh, in the world history, it is a short time, but in the global teacher education, formal structured teacher education, it is a long time. And um, if we compare the Finnish education system um, results with, for example, the other OECD countries, uh, where the social status of the uh, citizens is about the same than in Finland, still Finland is succeeding better. Um, so it, it, it can't be only about uh, from what kind of families the students come from. There, there has to be other explanators as well. And uh, for us nationally, um, many of us think that uh, the, the single factor that we can nominate that is changeable, that can be affected in other countries as well, is the teacher qualities, what the teachers are, who they are, how they perform their profession, and more important than that, how they are educated. So we believe in that. We do believe in that. And um, I look to this from the perspective what I've been doing for the past 25 years. I graduated uh, from the very same university that I just mentioned exactly 25 years ago. So this is my 25th anniversary year within education. I graduated uh, as a primary teacher. I didn't need to go to the Harvard University because I was accepted to be a primary teacher in Finland. <laughs> <laughs> and just as my colleague Elise as well. And uh, I worked in the, in the classroom with children from 7 to 12 years uh, for more than 15 years. And, and my heart and soul still is in teaching. Uh, anything else? I'm a, well, first, I'm a mother, but secondly, a teacher, definitely. And uh, during my, my years, I also worked as a, as a vice principal, a teacher educator. So I, I, so I worked as a supervisor teacher for young student teachers. And for the past six years, what I've been doing, I've been uh, a lot of things within education, but, but uh, most of my work has been educating other than Finnish teachers. And uh, for the past years, most, mostly in Asia. So I've been running several uh, uh, professional development training courses for Asian teachers. The first in, in Bangkok this February, a two-week two training course. So I've, so I've also worked with Thai teachers already. And from that perspective, I still say that if we want to affect to education in a single school, uh, in a city, in a district, in a country, yes, we should need to affect to what the teachers do, who they are, and how they are educated. Um, this is what we think Finnish teachers are, and this is what we think Finnish teachers are educated towards. Uh, as Dr. Salberry already mentioned, uh, being a teacher in Finland is, is a popular profession. It is a respected profession. It is a trusted profession. And in, in that sense, we are, we are very fortunate in Finland. Uh, but we can't be only satisfied with that. We need to keep on con uh, continuously developing our teacher education as well. And there is a major curricular reform, a national, big national reform uh, 
that that is ongoing still in Finland. But but uh, uh, August 2016, we st started implementing uh, our new curriculum framework, national curriculum framework, the first time, and that definitely needs to affect to the teacher education at the universities as well. How do we keep up with the qualities of the competencies of the teachers when there's a new curricular framework which has changed quite a lot? And for example, that is a current question in our country. What do we do uh, in order to educate the new teachers, but what do we do with the existing teachers uh, when there is a new curriculum? Um, teachers are autonomous reflective practitioners in Finland. We will talk a little more about that later. Um, principals in Finland are teachers as well. So you can't be a principal in Finland if you did not originally qualify as a teacher of the same level than you want to become a principal. And princip school principals are more leaders than managers. They allow teacher autonomy, they allow teamwork, they should share the leadership. Not everybody does that yet, I think, but, but we very much want to emphasize shared leadership. There is teacher leadership, there is student leadership defined in a good school. We will ne next go through 10 qualities uh, of a Finnish teacher. We will go through those qualities uh, with pictures. And all these pictures, they are, um, there's usually a Finnish teacher in the picture, but non-Finnish students. And these are actual real pictures taken by, by our organization within our projects where Finnish teachers with their competencies, their teacher education are working out there, out of Finland. And I won't talk too much about the pictures, you might want to ask about them later. But, but at the same time, when listening to the qualities of the Finnish teacher, you might want to have a look at the pictures and figure out what is happening out there. What is the teacher doing? What are the students doing? What does the learning environment look like? What kind of a method do you think is being utilized in the picture? How do you see the teacher-student relationship? such kind of aspects that are very important in a learning situation. What are the materials being used? Okay, and to do this, I would like to invite my colleague, Ms. Elise Tarvainen, to join me. And specifically, I would ask Elise, with what I'm saying, to give the uh, global insight to this. So I will tell about the Finnish teacher and then Elisa will add on what she thinks we've been experiencing out there. Is it okay, Elisa? That's very okay and, and thanks for inviting me to join. Uh, good afternoon to all and especially here now and, and uh, in this presentation I will kind of take a role as a school director because currently I'm also working for one international school in Qatar as a school director and, and supporting that school um, implementing and applying the, the Finnish approaches so so I try to really go to practical experiences of how the Finnish uh, ideas are applied or are they applicable at all in, in different contexts but Finland because I guess this is the key questions that you are puzzled now that what you hear is it anyhow applicable here? Um, just as Dr. Salbari already told or we will at least highlight the fact that most of the Finnish teachers they, they are um, they hold their master's level qualification and I totally agree with Dr. Salbari that, that uh, the master level qualification as it is, um, if, if the contents of the education are not suitable, it doesn't matter if you have a master's or bach bachelor's or, or a diploma program education. But in Finland, yes, 
if you want to be a teacher, you need to hold a master's qualification for the primary level. It is master's of education uh, for the secondary and up, up to that level, it's master's of the uh, science that you're, you're studying, Mas master of science is master of uh, English language and literature and so on, whatever subject you're teaching. And the early learning teachers, they are either bachelors or masters of early learning. So for the first 12 years of the child's life, the teachers are masters of education or early education, not of their scientific subject, but they're majoring in education. And that might tell you about our approach to education. Instead of emphasizing content knowledge of a scientific subject, academic subject, we emphasize knowledge of education, teaching and learning. Um, if you want to be a teacher in vocational studies, bachelor is definitely uh, in, the, in the middle sector, the, the minimum qualification. And still, all the teachers need their pedagogical qualification. So if you studied your master's in chemistry, for example, and, and you still want to become a teacher, yes, you can do that, but not before your 60 credits of pedagogical studies. So you can't be a teacher, no matter whether you are a doctor of physics or mathematics or whatever, if you don't have your pedagogical studies, no need to apply to be a teacher. And this is what, what uh, we heard already um, this is fact from 2015. Class teacher education seems to be the most popular. 11% of the uh, applicants nationally uh, are invited to join uh, the programs. Subject teacher education highly depends on what subject you want to study, uh, how much the, the intake is. And still for vocational teacher education, not more than 28% of the applicants are accepted. Uh, Elise, do you have any comments on the master level qualification and the approach to it when you have looked at the teachers out there? Sure. Um, I need to say that I fully agree with Mr. Uh, Dr. Passi told earlier calling for um, teaching considered as a profession. And actually, when I learned this lesson was in Emirates in 2012, we started there a, a teacher training um, program where the Emirati teachers were trained towards master degree program. And actually, they gained a new type of master's program to be a primary teachers. And one day, there was one lady, Miss Rafia, who came to me one day at the school. Miss Elise, Miss Elise, you know what I have learned? No, I don't know what I have learned. You want to share and tell me? You know, I have been a teacher for 10 years in our system, and I never understood that teaching is not a job, it's not task, but it's a profession. You know, through the studies, that lady came to a conclusion of considering her job within their existing system in a new way. She found the profession while before she was considering more as a job. And it was all about this program that she was going through and building her personal uh, teacher philosophy, teacher identity. And, and my perspective globally would be really to ask the question for, for the teacher training institutions, universities, that what is your teacher uh, training curriculum like? Should you start the improvements or, or uh, development from upskilling teachers on the field? Or should you go beyond and think about the new coming teacher generations uh, of through 
which kind of curriculum you train them through. Many times it not, it's not that you need to build a new, new curriculum, but it's reorganizing the contents, it's building interlinkages, and, and so on. It doesn't need major reform, but the question is that, that what kind of teacher training curriculum leads to this idea of finding teaching as a profession? Uh, the second item of being a Finnish teacher is the high social status. Uh, the same young people in Finland that uh, apply for uh, to be medical doctors or lawyers or engineers, it's from the very same group of young students that apply for the, the, the teacher training uh, programs. And uh, I think it's a long tradition, quite often we are asked, why is it a respected job in Finland? Why do so many teachers, uh, young young people, want to become teachers? Um, after having talked with the so many young people, quite often they say that, well, because I think that being a teacher, you have an authentic chance to affect to the future. And, and that is, I think, touching is if something. As a teacher, a young teacher believes that as a teacher, I have a chance to affect to the future of this nation and of the whole world. Yes, I do agree on that. Um, by this, we want to maintain the high social status of the teacher. We, we definitely want to maintain it. And, and one way to do that is exactly what Elisa was talking about, to understand that, wow, I'm holding a profession. I'm a professional, I, and I need to maintain and perform as, as what a high professional does. Any comments, Elise? Um, only a small one, um, because in many societies uh, where I have been working, uh, people have asked me that, well, that's not the case in our society. Teaching is not considered as a de desired career, and uh, that's not the case. So we cannot consider this, this high status issue at all, if we think about developing our system. From my perspective, trust or social status is not something that you need to wait for. It's not something that, that you need to ask for. You gain them. It, it's about how, how you work how you take the baby steps, you take the actions, and then the status and the trust, they follow. And, and there shouldn't be any such consideration that we couldn't do this because uh, we don't enjoy the high status, but, but it's about still going and knowing that the status will follow. What if you made a survey, maybe you've even made that, but, but you went around Thailand and you asked the teachers how much of them feel that they are valued in the society or, or they are holding a profession that is valued in the society. Let's have a look at what the Finnish teachers have answered to this. Um, this is from an international study, TALIS, OECD TALIS from 2013. The following next tallies is coming up in 2018. So this is the, the recent one. It's from over 5 million teachers in 34 countries. So it's, it's quite wide. And this is what Finnish teachers have answered. 90% of the Finnish teachers answer that they are satisfied, satisfied with their job, 90%. That is a high percentage, I think. 70% of them say that they would choose teaching again. And 60% think that their work is valued in society. And if you have a look at the next slide, uh, you see how the, the uh, dark green is Finland there. You see how Finland uh, is, is compared with other countries. Uh, teachers asked whether they think that the teaching profession is valued in society. The highest one is from Croatia, Europe. And, and all the other, other ones are behind um, Croatia, Finland. For example, the last one on the right side is the United States. And the lowest ones, France, uh, Slovakia, uh, Sweden. Uh, 
uh, one reason to become a teacher is the fact, a very, very practical fact, that teachers in Finland had, have good employment prospects. Um, teacher unemployment rate in, in Finland is, is quite low. Yes, there are unemployed teachers. Uh, specifically, when you graduate, it's not easy to get a permanent job, but yes, it is quite easy to get a substitution position. Um, that is one challenge for us, actually, as uh, what we do for one, one thing we do for work is, is uh, finding Finnish educational experts for overseas projects. And since the uh, employment prospects are so good in Finland, sometimes it, it's a little challenging. Uh, we don't have such a group than unemployed teachers. And the master's degree that the teachers get, uh, it's quite much favored by other professions as well. So teachers are highly valued when they are applying for other jobs than teaching jobs as well, which of course then takes them away from the teaching job sometimes. Elise. Um, I would like to add something that that slide leads to me to think about the career trajectory of, of teachers. So once you uh, graduate and you become a teacher. It's not all. We used to have a time when teachers considered that, well, now I'm a teacher, I will get a government position and that's long lasting and forever. That's secure job. But nowadays, because of globalization and, and Finland doing great efforts to internationalize and, uh, and, and teachers getting more uh, culturally aware and um, and having language proficiencies also the international careers have have been considered as an option and as Dina mentioned that that to become a principal you need to have the teacher qualification for respective level of education so that's also another thing related to our teacher education that that you are not studying only for the job but you are studying for the profession within later on you can develop and build your capacities from the early beginning of the the education in finland we are heading to lifelong learning philosophy our teachers are encouraged and nurtured to to really take continuous studies, um, different kind of upscaling programs, because we want them to also to be developers of their school and participate in education system curriculum, uh, national curriculum development as well. Actually, what Elisa just said leads us here, us telling that Finnish teachers are inquiring they are development oriented and they are research based. One important aspect that uh, they are teaching to our young teacher students at the universities these days is to become researchers of their own work. So by the observations and experiences that the teachers collect, they should constantly develop their own work individually, in teams, school-wise, we think that the developmental actions mainly don't come from out of the educational organizations, but from inside. So the initiatives for development, they mostly come from teachers. In the teacher education, yes, they very much combine practice theory and practice and and that we definitely want to lead to teachers being researchers of their own work um, Finnish teachers are a funny group in a way um, they participate voluntarily on in-service training courses even at their own expense during their free time. Um, 
which is, I think, very not typical uh, around the world. Finnish teachers have quite long holidays, yes, and quite often a Finnish teacher wants to join a training course during the holiday, even if it was not required and even if nobody paid for that. And um, something again from the Middle East as my experience, how we have utilized this special professional capacity from the school. Uh, we have asked our, our teachers to, to make different kind of uh, action research studies from the school to collect evidence, to collect information, um, to make different kind of piloting projects and then report on those. And, and also the local teachers, doesn't mean that, that there were only Finnish teachers, but also the local teachers when they were taught this idea that how to reflect one's own work, how, how to measure students' motivation, how to develop different kind of, of homeschool uh, uh, collaboration models and, and, and then then uh, report on the results and collect evidence on the school performance. It appeared actually that with this very specific skill set, we were able to meet the locally required standards to show off, to show the school performance, to show teacher performance, to, to show students' motivation and, and academic performance result. So many times, um, these requirements set from outside the national standards that do, you need to meet. You don't need to wait for the measures to come outside. You can create the measures to show that you meet the standards. And that was something that, that we found out one day that, yes, we can take the development on our hands. We can be even a bit ahead. Because when the school monitoring was coming and, and the principal appraisals were done, uh, in our, our schools, um, we figured out that, wow, we actually had great evidence, we had reports on this and that, we were able to show action research reports made by our teachers, and you know, the monitors, they were really shocked, amazed that they had never seen this. But, but this is, again, something that that, that we learned that it's not just to wait what's given to us or required from us, but it's that we were ahead offering already what was expected. That is somehow about the teacher autonomy as well, which we then come back, we'll come back later. Finnish teachers are student-centered. We believe that uh, what is happening at schools it is mainly not about teaching, but it is about learning. And actually, the more emphasis should be put on how much learning is happening than what kind of teaching is happening. And that is what student-centeredness means for us. Uh, teacher's role is changing. We'll come back to that later as well. Um, teachers you, used to be called teachers strictly, and, and we, we, we have thought that teachers are here, teacher is standing here, that, and the students are there, and what we are unfortunately now doing, the teacher is mo mostly uh, talking and the students are listening. But, but uh, that is not what student-centered teaching and learning is. Um, student needs to be in the core of the teaching and learning. And that's when teacher is put to be a facilitator of learning. Um, we heard that that term has somehow a, a not the best possible uh, definition in Thailand, maybe. So in order to understand what the facilitator of learning means, we should need to talk more about that. But simply, uh, to, to put it briefly, it means that the task of the teacher is make sure in the classroom that all of, of the students are getting to their optimal best at their optimal level. And how the teacher that does, that is then up to the teacher. But it definitely does not mean that the teacher offers the same teaching for all the students. 
that is not student-centered teaching, teaching and learning. If there are 25 students in the classroom, more or less in the long run, run there should be 25 different kind of programs in the classroom offered. It doesn't mean that I teach you 25 differently at all times, but yes, individualization should happen in the classroom. And if those skills are not offered in the initial teacher training education, the teachers can't do that. They, they need to be provided with the skills for individualization, for example. What the student then is, uh, the student is partly a generator of content. Uh, the student should need to be the most active participator in the teaching and learning process. So less activity to the teacher, more activity to the students, unlike now, unfortunately. And uh, a student is somebody that is individually supported by the teacher. Elise, in our Qatar, Finland International School, where those pictures, for example, are from, how have the parents, how have the community, the global teachers reacted to the demand of student-centeredness? Um, that, that really has been a, a learning journey with some failures and uh, with some success because when we introduce this very new concept to a community that was considering education to be organized in a totally different way. And we, and we started to put the children to, to lay on the, the floors and play and have fun and being very active by themselves and with each other and teacher taking more of the role of the facilitators. Of course, there, there were the questions that, that where is the teaching? What are we paying for? Uh, the, the, the families are paying customers for the school and, and they naturally asked that, that why, why don't we get teachers? teaching as, as we are paying for that. And we had a quite debate of that, are you paying of the learning outcomes of your students or just teaching, teacher delivering lesson plans? And, uh, and that was the debate in the beginning. We have now uh, our third year in action and uh, I'm really proud of the team at the school as we have now children from 60, 60 nationalities in our school and our teaching staff come from 16-16 nationalities. And it doesn't mean that they are only these Finnish teachers applying the student-centered methodology and philosophy, but now they are all the other teachers as well, no matter from what nationalities they are coming from. And, and they adapted that easily with the support of their co-teachers. And, and as Dr. Pashi showed the other slide, that is it so that if there is some kind of a low performing or low ability teacher, would the one perform to the same level with the help of colleagues? Yes, I truly can say yes. And this is very much of what we should pay attention to, of how teachers te teach teachers. And, and how they learn from each other. And as your question of how teacher generations teach and support the younger teacher generations uh, about. Uh, the families, of course, they asked first the questions. And now the feedback is that this is magical. They, they call it magical. And I asked that, what, what, what is magic in this? How, how do you see that this is magical? For us, it's natural. It, it's, uh, it's what students do and, and children do at a certain age. They have fun, they play, they learn. I, I wouldn't consider it magical, but, but they consider. And, and, and when they started to explain, they told us that, that it's so wonderful because in the morning they are happy to go to school. They love to go to school because they are waiting for what's, what's happening there and, and they know the school is for them. It's, it's not for the parents. And, and also uh, school provides them so many different kind of activities during the day that uh, when they come home, 
they are they are more balanced relaxed because they didn't need to sit some some seven lessons in a row listening and being passive learners and and that actually is the life in the evenings at homes and and that was amazing results or if, I don't know if you can call them results, but but feedback that we didn't even come to think about it. But but parents, uh, they they were able to reckon these, these these differences. But so far, we are happy and we have no doubt that we will continue in this track that that we have chosen really to emphasize student-centered individualized learning. I will give you a couple of more insights uh, from. Uh, closer to to Bangkok uh, from from Beijing, China, and also from Bangkok. Uh, one of the main topics of our teacher training courses is student-centered teaching and learning, which, at least, what I've experienced in Beijing and and what I'm starting to experience here in Bangkok, student-centered teaching and learning is uh, not a very familiar topic to a traditional teacher. Uh, at least not in China, and, and uh, I'm getting the understanding, and neither in, in Thailand. And uh, during our training courses, we've been putting the student-centered methodologies. Firstly, uh, we've been looking those from the uh, theoretical point of view. Why student-centered teaching and learning? What are the benefits? Uh, what might they cause, and so on? And they, when they, then we put them into practice. We do student-centered activities with the participants of the training courses, and and uh, a very clear. Uh, experiential feedback from the participants from China and Thailand, for example, has been that, wow, I've never understood that teaching can be done this way. I've never even thought about this. And yes, I will definitely try this in my classroom. Uh, there is hesitance as well, because the first question for the, for the teacher from China or Thailand is that, uh, there's the curriculum and there are the upcoming tests. How can we manage to deliver all the knowledge and information if we start looking at education from the student-centered perspective? What if we start, uh, for example, uh, developing the students learning to learn skills? Ah, they don't need to be opposite each other. Even with the very strict curriculum, knowledge-based curriculum that you can't change, yes, we believe and we've actually seen how it, how the learning to learn skills, how the student-centeredness supports the student performance, even with the, the kind of a strict and, and very demanding curricular items. So, so we don't need to think that they exclude each other. That's that's what we've experienced. Uh, this is another research uh, already from 2008. It's done by the National Council for Evaluation uh, of Education in Finland. And uh, this is a few things that Finnish teachers believe in. They believe in equity and encouragement in the classroom. They believe in individual support when it comes to student performance. Uh, they believe in strengthening the pupils' thinking skills and developing the pupils' self-confidence and tolerance. There is nothing about mathematical competencies, literate, literature, uh, scientific subjects, and so on. Uh, they, they, of course, they are there. But this is what Finnish teachers mainly believe in when wanting to gain high results in teaching and learning. And uh, this has to do with uh, how we believe that we should provide the future generations, what, with what kind of competencies we should provide the future generations with. And the, the Finnish answer is not mathematical competencies or scientific or, or that kind of competencies, but we believe that these are the kind of competencies that our future generation should need to be provided with, alongside, of course, with, with basic academic skills. And maybe to add something uh, to this, uh, from the global community point of view and, and uh, global teacher training point of view, teachers are 
a very impressive role model for their students. And one of the key issues is that what kind of model our teachers as a community give to the students. And, and these questions I, I, will, I would also pass to, to our teacher training institutions and curriculum in Finland and everywhere globally, that how do we prepare our teacher students today so that in the future uh, their uh, approach as a colleague uh, in a community would be um, enhancing equity and in encouragement within the teachers and how they give individual support for their colleagues, how they are strengthening the thinking skills or other skill set or assets of their colleagues and how they are developing their colleagues' self-confidence and tolerance. There are many layers that when you consider this. I promise that we will not too much talk about the pictures, but but I want to talk a little bit a little bit about this picture. And Elisa, you, you just led us <laughs> nicely to what is happening here. I, I didn't remember that. <laughs> <It was accidental. laughs> uh, community building. Um, Dr. Passi already referred to this. Uh, yes, teachers are individual autonomous operators, but, but more than that, they should be committed to work together with their peers, with their colleagues. And I think too little emphasis is put to that in our educational institutions. We want our individual teachers to be effective and knowledgeable and, and with a good performance, but, but we don't put enough of emphasis to what our team of teachers is able to perform. Uh, this is a real life picture from our Qatar school. You can see the international staff there. And, and by looking at the teachers' faces, you can see what kind of an in-service training course they are attending, def de definitely voluntarily and even having fun. And, and, and in that kind of a uh, in-service training, uh, maybe more than the activities, they are doing team building. They are building the, the learning uh, environment better for the students as well. Maybe I tell you a bit from the, the story behind the, the, the picture. It is from the week before the school opened for this academic year. And, and we called um, all, the uh, all the teachers and teaching staff to come to school a week earlier to, to have very intensive orientation and preparation for, for the coming academic year because of actually our um, figures were doubling uh, last fall and 50% of the teaching staff uh, was new. So, so I got some 40 new staff members and and this is where we started and what we were doing while at the same time we were planning uh, the education curriculum implementation for the different levels uh, in different units but this is this is part of the story how we brought people together and, and one of the great teachers of mine once told me that, Elise, there is not even the biggest and most important things happening in the whole world unless there is first two individuals that connect in a human level. We are human beings and this is what we need to be. And, and I, can, I can honestly say this from the administration point of view as in, in charts of the finance as well, that yes, this time was worth investment. I suppose that there are educational managers, uh, administrators here as well. You might consider something like that the next time you are uh, planning a PD afternoon for your staff. Let's do something else than, than develop the curriculum or, or uh, consider the new teaching and learning methods. They are highly important, but this is important every now and then as well. A Finnish teacher in general has a strong professional identity 
and professional ethics. And every single teacher should have that. Professional identity and professional ethics. Uh, I will read you directly a passage from the uh, uh, curriculum, the teacher training curriculum from the University of Uvascular, from where we come from, how they define uh, professional ethics. The ethical dimension refers to the ability of acting ethically and evaluating situations in order to make decisions that benefit the student holistically as a person. Making ethical decisions that benefit the student holistically as a person. Teacher ethics. Let me continue. Making decisions that fundamentally affect the student in this way is a significant responsibility for an educator. So making ethical decisions that benefit the student the best possible way is a significant responsibility of an educator. Could you sign this, teacher educators? Do you think you can agree on this? Such decisions should therefore be made according to one's own critical thoughts not blindly according to convention. Teacher and critical thinking, not blindly obeying what, what is being asked. As in commonly the case in many pedagogical institutions. So at least our university is supporting teachers to be critical more than anything else. And that's what we call is ethical professionalism, professional ethics. That's excellent point. And this is for sure what we have both been trained to. But we both have also faced the reality outside Finland that how does the Finnish educational ethics apply in a different context. You can imagine Dina working in, in, in China. We have something going on in, in Vietnam, uh, thinking of Arabic, um, Islamic cultures. There, there is a lot to take into consideration. And, and very much the, the teacher ethics is understanding of sensitivity and the need of contextualizing. Even within one country, you need to contextualize. You, you might have children from different nationalities or, or religious background in the same class. And again, you need to be able to create and, and harmonize the ethics that you can, but, but still give the highest respect uh, to the background that the child is coming from. And, and this is part of the ethics. It's, it's also the sensitivity, respect and understanding that we are talking of such underlying issues that, that, that you need to be aware. And this is what we are heading to in our teacher training, that, that we don't only build them ethically strong, but also ethically weak, so that, that they understand that, that there is a lot beyond what they think about ethics, and it is as important as the ethical or moral principles that they carry. Was there a remark on timing? Uh, not yet. yet. <laughs> Finnish teacher is a producer and developer of learning materials in many ways. Um, the book, the study book, the textbook does not regulate teaching and learning in Finland in no ways. The curriculum does but not the book, not the materials. Um, we have good publishers, good national publishers that, that uh, produce learning materials for the schools. Who makes the materials for those publishers? Teachers do. Um, not all the teachers use books these days anymore. They might use electronic materials, digital materials. They might use their own made materials. Uh, they might sometimes uh, have the students make the materials with them. 
It's up to the student, uh, up to the teacher to decide. And teachers are educated to do that. Specifically in our, our overseas programs, we face this because quite often the new material for the new kind of teaching and learning simply does not exist. Quite often it's the language. In many of our projects, the schools are wanting to try parts of the Finnish curriculum. Uh, the contents don't match with what they've got so far. The teachers need to be trained to produce materials. And maybe just a practical example from, from our school, also related to that, that it's a, it's a Finnish school following the Finnish pedagogies fully, but we are teaching their Islamic studies, Qatari history, Arabic, and, and you can imagine that there is nothing from the learning material or curriculum point of view that we have in Finland. But still, our teachers, they apply Finnish pedagogy in implementing the curriculum and and all these um choices what comes to to learning materials or, or textbooks or worksheets or or any any other equipments that they use they do against the national standards and this is what i like to emphasize that for our teachers it's not enough that they deliver something or referring back to dr pass is saying that uh, handbooks or recipe books, they, they are not the way to improve teaching. We should teach our teachers and our principals really to let the curriculum standards to guide teachers. There needs to be a full understanding of what are the standards we are training towards and how, how these standards guide our choices. A Finnish teacher has got a wide methodological toolbox. A good teacher anywhere in the world should have a wide methodological toolbox. Unfortunately, what I've experienced, in many countries the teachers are educated to be educational technicians in the way. What I mean by that, the teachers are only educated to follow the strict curricular guidelines, which to the kind of the worst extent that I've seen, the teachers are almost given the lines during their lessons. And the students are given the lines in a way that the teachers only accept certain answers to the questions. And, and that is maybe the furthest that we could think of what Finnish teachers do. Um, Finnish teachers are given already during their initial training a wide methodological toolbox from which they can pick the suitable ones. And still going back to the researcher and developer of their own work, the teachers are constantly creating new methods individually and in the uh, teams of teachers. Uh, considering the student ability, the student uh, mentality, um, the student temperament, uh, the whole class, considering the content that they are teaching, considering learning environment. So there are several decisions that and, the teacher needs to make. And also I would like to add to your list that uh, the resources, because also even in the rural area in Finland, in, in the very poorest municipality and uh, in the smallest school, there, there is not that much resources available. Still, this toolkit is available because it's, it's the, the, the capacity of the teacher to create that teaching and learning opportunities with the resources available. Many times I, I've, I face the question that, well, we don't have resources to buy this, that and, and whatever, and we don't have all the newest equipment and we don't have the devices and we don't have computers for all the children, so how, how could we? But, but basically, for me, it's not acceptable excuse. Teacher can do so much with the resources existing. And it's about imagination, it's about creativity, and it's about sharing within the teacher's community. 
a global trend seems to be the digitalization coming to the schools and a failure in considering the new digital tools and, and uh, applications is to think that when the e-learning is brought to the classroom, that saves everything. If the teachers don't know how to use those new tools and methods, it won't save anything. The opposite, it will destroy even the rest of the learning. So what we have, when we talk about teachers' methodological toolbox, when we get the new equipment and new kind of uh, tools to the classroom, the teachers need to be trained on how to utilize the new learning technologies, for example. And when you have been looking at these pictures, uh, definitely sometimes Finnish students and our global students sit at the desks as well. So it's a little provocative to have chosen such pictures where the students are not sitting at desks at all. But I have to say that quite often nowadays, teaching and learning looks exactly like this. It's a little... Uh, you, you can't see anything else, but you can see that the students are sitting on the floor and that they are working right there. So, so together, hand in hand with the a toolbox and um, materials, we should need to educate our teachers to utilize the learning environment creatively. And what you can do now already in your schools, please encourage your teachers to get out of the classroom please have them do that and let them do that. And the weather in Thailand during this, the winter months, it's been gorgeous. During our uh, February training, we spend a lot of time outdoors and, and the teachers enjoyed it so much. How can we do this? You just go and you do that and the students will enjoy that. So the whole understanding of the learning environment, for example, should be renewed in, in many of the schools. And the 10th item, I promise to give you 10 items. Finnish teachers are multitaskers and team workers. And uh, uh, our new curriculum even requires every single teacher to work together with other teachers. So you can't uh, follow the Finnish curriculum anymore as a teacher without collaborating with others. And, and that is a perfectly good thing. The older generation teachers, they are not so used to that yet, although, yes, we've been doing it for a long time. But the younger generation teachers already during their university years, there's basically not much anything else but, co but collaboration. They are very used to working together. Uh, even the, the tests, the exams, they can do together. There are a lot of group tests. Um, just to mention a few items, a lot of uh, collaborative reflection, team reflection, team assessment, and such things. So, so by this, we also want to enhance the so-called 21st century skills. Elise already mentioned that teachers need to model to the students the way of working and learning. Uh, collaboration is one thing. If the teachers don't collaborate, you can't expect the students to do that. This picture is, well, these are now all Finnish teachers. This is from uh, last December the 6th. The, the team of Finnish teachers is uh, presenting in the Finnish National Day performance. And, and uh, it's not a, a choir of students this time, it's a choir, a singing choir of teachers. Elise, could you still tell something about the, the teacher collaboration in a school where we've got about 100 adults from 60 different and 16 different countries. Uh, what kind of uh, challenges and what kind of uh, winnings there there have been with the collaboration? Um, now, after after 10 months, uh, I would say that I remember only the the winnings, the, the best parts. But but if I recall last August when we started, we got the new stuff in. There, there were really challenges as as well of when when the cultures were fused together and we tried to intensively uh, build shared understanding of learning and, and teaching and uh, 
and we had debates, uh, we had conflicts uh, with opinions, but all, all the tents we had actually took us beyond what we understood. So actually, we, none of us had the right answer or the best idea in the beginning, but when we fused the ideas, we got something that was more valuable, which was much more than any of us could have done alone. So, so when, when you join the, the uh, intelligence from the organization, when, when you give space for, for the brainstorming and, 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 and ideas and, and see that they are seeds for something else, this is where the innovations are born. And we are eagerly after um, pedagogical innovations, educational innovations. Finland is good now, but we want to be good tomorrow. We want to be good after 10 years. And in education, you know, it's, it's the situation that, that you either go down or, or you improve. In education, you, you cannot be stable. So if you start to be on your comfort zone and, and thinking of that, we are quite okay, this is quite good performance. We got quite good uh, appraisal results or monitoring or we met the standards quite nicely. Uh, this is where, where, where it starts going down. Because education is seeking development improvement from day to day. And, and the resource to do that are really the teachers, grassroots level doing the job. And, uh, and this is truly what, what I believe in and I'm so proud of the, the results of the team and, and my job uh, in charge of the school has been more or less of giving space, trust and autonomy, these different kind of teacher groups to do the um, development and, and try things without not knowing whether they will succeed or not. It's accepting failures as well. And that's not an easy part. But if you want to do something, failure possibility is always there. But from the failures, you learn actually more than from the success. You've been sitting here for the whole of the afternoon and most of you are still carrying on wonderfully. A few more quite light things. Um, we will soon watch a video clip of a, of a Finnish teacher out there. Uh, but before that, uh, I will give you, uh, this is not a tongue twister, but, but uh, I don't know how it would work in, in Thai language. Um, do you want your teachers to do the right things or do you want them to do the things right? Because if you want them to do the right things and you let them choose what the right things are, you make them trust it. But if you demand them to do those things and do them right. The teachers are in need of strong surveillance. And unfortunately, the more you inspect the teachers, the worse they perform, the less motivated they are, the more surveillance there is. The more trust and autonomy you are encouraged to give to the teachers, the more responsibility they take and the better the results are and the more motivated they are. This is the so-called a vicious cycle of decreasing professional autonomy. This is a research based, a Finnish uh, university research from the university where we come from. And. Uh, we know that from, from a system where there is teacher assessment, when the, where there is quite much teacher surveillance, um, you should not go directly to let them do whatever they want. 
well, our teachers are not let to do what, whatever they want, but they have a lot of autonomy. But this is something that you might consider, and you might consider the starting point where you could start giving more and more autonomy to your professionals, to your experts of teaching and learning. And I'm checking whether I want to take one more thing before the video. Five minutes. Okay. Let's watch a video clip. <laughs> Um, this is a, a Finnish teacher, Miss Emmi, uh, working in Abu Dhabi uh, with a group of Emirati girls. Uh, these, these are first graders, first grade students. They are six, about six years old, not some of them even that old. Uh, they are non-native speakers of Arabic. Uh, they are learning English language for the first year with a Finnish teacher. And this is uh, from a very ordinary uh, morning circle of theirs. Let's see if we can make this work. Right. Now, look how many apples there are in the tree. Too many. We, how many were we? Who remembers? How many were we? How many did we count? How many did we go? Done. How many girls? How many girls at school? Who remembers? Do you want? Fifty. Let's check it once again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, this is from a classroom. The students are practicing sounds in small groups. One of the students, the one in the left, is a facilitator. She's the one hold, holding the sounds, and the others are practicing the sounds, saying them aloud according to, to, to what she shows to them. And later you see that there are other groups behind there as well. So the teacher is actually behind the camera, and the, and the students are working while the teacher is filming. Actually, the best moments as, as a teacher, at least for me, they've been the moments when, when I can sit back, I can go to the corner and watch my students learn. When I can release myself from learning, I have facilitated, I have organized the learning so that students are active. I can go out of the room and have my coffee and then come back and they are learning at all times. And that is what student-centered teaching and learning is. Shall we finish here? <laughs> You've been really wonderful. A long, long, long talk. But that, that is actually what was uh, requested from us. And, and we wanted to fulfill the request. So thank you so much. And, and now we're waiting eagerly for the questions. Do we should we need to have a break here? A ten minutes break? Right, so everybody please be back at three forty. Three forty back here. Thank you. Uh -huh. Because one, 
So we try to build it within a, in a way that it would give more questions than, than rather the
So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, we are now ready for our Q and A session. So, if you would like to ask any questions, please uh, raise your hand, and we'll deliver the microphone to you. This would be for everybody comes in. I just, you know, ask the quick questions. That uh, I want to first. I want to uh, make sure that my understanding is correct or not. Uh, your global uh, global teacher, your your global education means that you want to apply your Finland. Uh, education style into the third country like Qatar and if it, it works or not right mm. your yes uh, I'll go a little backwards uh, the interest towards Finnish education did not uh, create because of the Finnish efforts mm. so we did not start developing our education system to become popular and famous globally but we started to develop develop our education system because we realized that it is a highly important success factor in our natural future yes. and because of the the ranking high in in some national uh, uh, examinations uh, some some global uh, examinations uh, uh, people from all over the world started coming to Finland and, and asking what they, they could learn from us yes and that's why uh, we've started utilizing the Finnish expertise in education to develop uh, educational systems as elsewhere as well so, so if this was your question the answer is yes yes so so in that context I would like to ask your question what does international mean to you Globally, it's you know you 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 uh, you do the same thing no matter what context it is. Just Microsoft company, they sell the same product in whatever the market is. So I think what you are doing in global, uh, you know, education is just like a, like what Microsoft is doing. And my question is, why should it be international? International is a different from globalization. International is the two, uh, you know, the, just as you said, that two different things meet face to face and. We have the new culture that is internationalization that I understand, my understanding. So I, I would like, to, I'm very interested, how does it connect to your global education and internationalization? Thank you. Thank you for the question. It's one of the very, I would say, foundational ones. And uh, it's a very simple answer from our perspective. For us, international means fusion. It's fusion. As, as mentioned earlier, there is no such concept in education which is called copy-pasting. Mm. And from my point of view, education is not a product that you can export or import. Systems can learn from each other through a fusion process. So in educational context, international is fusion. Okay, so do you think that you are doing implementation in Qatar, right? Is, is it true, correct that you are do this implementation in Qatar? Can you provide us some other cases in other national, other nation like, you know, maybe Japan or Asia or? Hmm. Um, also a bit, this is a bit semantic question and goes to the wording. Um, I would still say that we are not implementing, we are more or less building Qatari application of Finnish education. So you are creating the new style in 
the context of the kata. Exactly. So, and um, that model mm, cannot be brought, be brought here, here or it cannot be brought back to Finland. Yes, so it is a different. So it's different. Problem. It's new, uh, it's unique. In that unique. sense, it is international mm. Mm, because mm. the new culture met and the new yeah, creative. Exactly. Oh, thank you very much. I understand very clearly. Yeah. And uh, we believe that, yes, we do have the best education system in Finland, but we don't believe in our education system succeeding as it is anywhere else than in Finland. So yes, you're totally right that we need to take the local context always into uh, account. And that's why wherever we go, we want to sit down with the local experts to utilize their local expertise in order to create something unique and new where our expertise might be utilized as an added value. Any more questions? Or comments, or you can even question us, challenge us, as Tina called earlier. With his test. All right. Um, my name is Green Dry. I'm from the um, Language Institute of Tamasad University, and my background is at uh, teaching in in uh, high school level before. I've been teaching in high school for five five years, and then I moved moved to um, you know the high, higher education level. And it's um, your talk is very. Um, very interesting interesting in in how you know to train the teachers and also i can see a lot of potential that thai teachers and thai education system can be improved but um the thing is um i would like to talk about our very con controversial issue now about the new teacher recruitment and the new policies about this is that um um, the government or the, the teacher council will allow the teachers that um, not the teacher that like the the um, teacher to be in the future um, that those who only receive the degree for um, for general education like not not specifically learning about being teacher so um, just to give you a little bit of background that, um, to be a teacher here basically you need to pass um, not to, not to pass the exam, I mean, um, they have to study for five years, four years of general education and also the psychologies and um, pedagogy, right? And also um, one whole year in practicing in the school. But um, the thing is nowadays, the policy maker will change since it, um, he claimed that our our country has been suffers from from lack of teacher the from the shortage of having a teachers and also the teacher that can teach a specific um, subject so they they change the policy from receiving all those those um, students who um, study in educate um, at faculty of education to all open to all all the um, faculty okay so the problem is that um we have we have confronted a lot of of um problem after receiving those those um teachers that passed the exam from the past um a couple years ago but now they change this policy to to receive those back again and then they they will provide they um kind of promise that they will provide a training session for those those um you know the test taker that pass pass and become the teachers in the school well my question is that um have have finland had any problems or encountered that kind of particular problems you know so i don't know because um for me as as my my own experiences and i see a lot of teachers that haven't that didn't didn't study in the education um background that they suffered a lot in in the school in teaching especially in teaching and a lot of them i mean maybe most of them you know resigns after after they have been assigned for many hours of teaching in the school and then it's create a lot of you know problem after that so i don't know if finland has has um 
encounter these kind of problems? And also, do you provide a training, training program for the teachers that you know, pass the exam to become a teacher in the school? Thank you. Okay. Um, we were just discussing that which of one will start. The, 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 the question was extremely important and uh, it would not be fair to say that no, Finland has ever faced these problems. Of course we have. We have a long history in developing education. As Tina mentioned, uh, the Finnish teacher education has been in place uh, 150 years. And there have been different stages and also major reforms. Uh, government has changed the standards and and these transition phases have been really challenging and uh, the key success factor through them has been of what kind of transition phase support is provided and organized and how it is funded and uh, it's for sure that that for these kind of transitions um, you need upskilling program or some uh, advanced level studies or however you would like to call them and they need to meet exactly the gap they are preaching studies from the old to the new requirements they need to be carefully planned and again the curriculum standards as a as a guiding key principles and uh, and they are national they are not again something that that you can just purchase with money from somewhere because you want uh, these these new skill sets to really meet the the new requirements and the local settings and the standards they need to include uh, professional development projects um, in in their existing schools and and so on how we have tackled that in finland is that we have a separate 60 european credit long which is equivalent to 1500 hours uh, pedagogical studies available for each level of education and specifically for those who have substance studies but not necessarily the deep understanding of pedagogies throughout their career they can take these additional studies as a separate course they are university level studies and then they include and are based on personal development plan so they are individual plans that recognize the strengths but also the gaps and then it defines the bridges which are the solutions and also the the professional development projects that our school community are engaged so this is our finish solution and maybe that there are some ideas that that could be considered but i would i would highly um recommend that that you start building your own bridge but if there are some building blocks that we can offer we would be happy to and if you if i got it right you also refer to the uh, parallel teacher qualifications and and how teachers from different backgrounds can work together and i think that is also a salary challenge in a way that if, if you're qualified this way or this way what will happen with your salary in in finland uh, we have uh, solved it so that we have national salary scales for teachers so no matter in which primary school, for example, in Finland you teach, if you have 15 years of experience and you are qualified as the national regulations uh, to tell, you get the very same salary. So the salary is only dependent on the years of experience and a slight portion of the salary might become because of the uh, demanding nature of your work but it is a very very small portion if you are not qualified according to the national standards if you have not got the masters of education or masters or whatever qualification you can work as a teacher if the principal so thinks but you cannot get a permanent position and if you don't have the national requirement for qualification, your salary will be lower. 
And that actually, the fact that you can't get a permanent position and you can't get the full salary, that quite often means that if you want to work as a teacher, you want to go for the pedagogical studies in order to get a permanent position and in order to get the full salary. I don't know if, if this gives you the answer on how we have solved this challenge. Yes. Yeah, I think it's a good idea to set up that that um, kind of standard. But but um, the problem is they they will have you know they will get the same salary amount mm -hmm. with with um, with the, the many hours of teachings and also other other administrative work. You know, mm -hmm. so when 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 those who hasn't have any experiences in in teaching mm -hmm. uh, and and also training before, so they will encounter a lot of um, you know the problems and then after that they resigned and again um, creating more problems to the government in order to you know recruit new new teachers to the school but but uh, I think it's totally understandable in your situation that you described that there is a uh, an evident lack of mm -hmm. teaching staff mm -hmm. yeah. I totally understand that the government yeah. tries to solve it in a way or another but mm -hmm. but uh, the kind of uh, uh, system-wise decision then causes uh, practical level, right. operational right. level challenges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and quite often the, the two different level of approach, mm -hmm. they are very difficult to, to solve. Yeah. Yeah. And referring to the earlier discussions we had today that, that Thailand is a country with quite a population compared to Finland. Still, even we are small in Finland, when we have uh, been seeking for the solutions, we have set up pilot projects. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't go at once to do the major reform or, or just to decide or plan this on the desk. Mm -hmm. we, we made some trial periods. Uh, we took a pilot group. We again collected evidence, made research on it, on what are the implications and challenges and winnings and, and, and so on. So piloting something somewhere could also be a good way to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Thank you so much. My Um, thank you, Miss Elise and Miss Tidet for coming to Thailand. Um, I, I work part-time at Rama Tipidi Hospital. Uh, I'm a pediatrician. I'm just wondering, what, what is medical education in Finland? Are you, you know, based on your success in your basic education, has that been incorporated into the medical education? Yeah. Thank you. It's a good question. I was smiling and, and definitely wanted to give you this answer because my son is a fifth year student in a medical college to become a medical doctor and, and um, also doing his PhD at, at the moment. So I have been following very closely at home the, this story of how our education is preparing and connected to, to medical education. And, uh, and, and something to say for that is, is that then to emphasize that Finnish education is general education. It prepares to any careers. And vocational career in Finland is as respected as the academic career. And you won't make the choices forever because our system has no dead end. So it means that later on during your career, you have your chance uh, to make the second or third choice. But my son, actually, uh, at the age of 16, uh, he made a choice to become a medical doctor. So he chose the, the general upper secondary. And out of the 16 subjects that our general upper secondary education uh, provides, she took, he took uh, science, chemistry, physics, mathematics, all the courses provided in these subjects. So uh, our general upper secondary actually enables any student already to start thinking the direction. While my daughter took psychology and ethics and uh, religion and whatever, 
something else but, but natural sciences. And, and it enables good careers. And, and then later on, our uh, universities, um, they base their enrollment on the contents provided in general upper secondary education. So no preparation years are needed, but, but the selection process uh, is defined to be such that it considers both the academic performance, but also your, can I say, suitability uh, for the career and profession. As we were uh, hearing from Dr. Passi about the teacher profession. So we don't take the students in as, as per the grades, but also the other assets are considered. And so it's in medical school as well. And, uh, and there is a, this kind of a clear line, but, but also the medical school in Finland, um, it can utilize the studies from chemistry, uh, physics, biochemistry. So if you don't get enrolled during your first year, you can take some um, study courses with other major and then they will be uh, recognized as, as part of your studies. But, but medical school in Finland, as many many other uh, university courses as well, they are they are research oriented as well. So they they will come practitioner, practicing doctors, but at the same time they, they have the met methodological know how on on research. I don't know if this is the answer. I'm not a specialist of the field, but I trust my son will be. <laughs> Actually, the very same goes for, I would say, most of the um, scientific or academic areas at the universities. So that uh, if you did not take certain courses or certain subjects during your upper secondary years, and, and you, after a couple of years of considering, you still want to go for that kind of a career, it doesn't matter. You can study those subjects later and still you can be accepted. And most of the university programs, they, not only, they don't only consider uh, the marks, the final marks on the general upper secondary, but there is an entrance test so that if you, if you did not work hard enough during your upper secondary years, it doesn't matter. You can work harder. After that, you can prepare and you can still get accepted to the university program through the entrance test. Hi, I'm Rina from Exxon Global Publishing. Uh, I have heard about uh, uh, phenomenon teaching uh -huh. Uh -huh, in Finland, right? Yeah, right. Uh, could you please give me about uh, a short idea for this approach? Thank you. Uh, phenomenon based teaching and learning. Um, it has been in Finland for a long time uh -huh. uh, because already when we started studied to be primary teachers um, more than 20 years ago, almost 30 years ago, uh, they already talked about integrating subjects. And specifically during the first years of education, uh, the first and second year of primary education, integrating subjects, um, learning uh, under themes has been very popular for a long time already. For example, uh, one topic that the first graders might have started with was family, my family. And then they studied mathematics under the topic of my family, uh, arts, PE, music, science, under the topic, not nominating that now we are studying mathematics, now we are studying arts, but combining uh, uh, the teaching and learning under the theme. Uh, more advanced nowadays, we talk about uh, phenomenon-based teaching and learning, and a phenomenon can, for example, be sustainable uh, future for a, a secondary level student, for example. 
so they can be quite quite heavy stuff phenomena and nowadays it means according to our curricula that the teachers need to work together so for example the mathematics teacher the english teacher and the history teacher they can decide together that let's put up a phenomenon based teaching project and then they look at a theme phenomenon through the glasses of each of the subjects and and usually it requires it requires teacher collaboration uh, and actually in our new curriculum it cre requires the teachers to involve students in the planning phase already so uh, the, the minimum requirement for venomous and based teaching and learning is once a year, at least a two week project uh, where the students need to be involved in the planning phase and there needs to be more than one teacher involved. And to add something that where the phenomenons come from, how we determine the, the phenomenons, who selects them. There is one requirement that they need to be derived from the student's daily life so that there is this real life connection so that it's not a theoretical theme that the teachers take from somewhere, but, but it's something that the children already have experiences from and they have the anchors inside them to, to start constructing new knowledge on they already uh, what, what on what they already have experienced from the team and and still sometimes it's it's hard to get from our theoretical talk I still try to put it a, a little more into the practice for example that the easy way to start phenomena based teaching and learning would be for the teachers to decide that let's utilize the same theme during our subject lessons and if they choose for example uh, the nature around us how to uh, maintain the good nature around us. During the mathematic lessons, they could count the, the amount of pollution or, or they, they could count the amount of traffic wherever, depending on the, on the level of students. So, so they would take something in mathematics that, that uh, goes under the topic of, of nature around us. In the arts lesson, they would uh, pick a topic and a method that, that has to do with the nature around us. They're the same they would do during the writing lesson. Let's, let's write about how to maintain the nature around us and so on. That is the easiest way to start utilizing phenomenon-based teaching and learning. Thank you very much. That's a topic for another seminar, oh, I would say. <laughs> yes, we could organize a two-week uh, training course on phenomenon-based teaching and learning. Okay, my name is Vidapan Chanhong from Faculty of Fire at Chiang Mai University. Uh, I want to know about the, the university situation for lecturer to teach the student in the, uh, in the uh, bachelor degree. Uh, because uh, you are sure about the, the study and for the student in the primary school, it's very really working in Finland. Okay, I, I want to know the, uh, in the university situation, how to teach them and how to uh, progress the teach and learn in the university level. So was your question about how uh, the, the university studies are implemented in Finland? In practical level, how do the university teachers teach the university students? So so teacher education programs. In teacher education programs or generally? Yeah, generally. generally. In, in any of the programs? Well, um, it of course depends on the domain uh, because there are domain specific ways of, of implement uh, the programs. But uh, what is specific in Finland? Well, it's not specific in Finland, but, but uh, it's characteristic in Finland as well that, that we emphasize research. And, and whatever is your major research is the, the main element, key component uh, of, of it at the end. And, and each of the, the students, uh, after the methodological studies, uh, they make their thesis. Uh, which is quite scientific and the requirements, the standards in Finland uh, for the thesis are quite strict compared to many other countries to say. 
and uh, and before that there, there are kind of um, three level studies preparing you to go for the thesis those there are the basic studies in your major then there are the advanced studies for your major methodological studies uh, which then takes you to prepare your thesis. And what is then the structure uh, within uh, separate programs? It, it varies, but the basic structuring is, is the same. Uh, the amount of, of European credits is the same for bachelor and, and, and masters. And uh, nowadays you can take your bachelor out and then later on continue your master's or you can apply for another master degree program like my daughter uh, who has a major in uh, anthropology ethnology and anthropology uh, she just graduated with her bachelor but now she is applying for a master degree program uh, for visual anthropology to, to Denmark because that program is not provided in Finland so basically it also uh, gives you the ability to apply for other master degree programs in anywhere around so it's very equal to the European program structures and it equals to basically any international program structures with some Finnish specifications I will show you a video to answer your question um, this is a time-lapse video and shows you in practice what they are nowadays doing at universities in Finland. Uh, what kind of methodologies they would use. Uh, this is um, videoed uh, during six months and they filmed uh, one learning space like this at the University of Helsinki uh, for six months. And then they squeezed the six months uh, to two minutes time lapse. And uh, you are going to see the learning environment. But watching the learning environment change gives you an understanding of what kind of methodologies they utilize at the University of Helsinki. So maybe that expanded the answer. This is what they are doing in Finnish universities these days. You could do it here as well. You've got the very same facility. Big room, big space, chairs and, and desks. That's all you need. And as you saw, there was lecturing as well. Yes, it is still needed. But, but uh, necessarily not full-time, a 
and definitely not full time in the uni Finnish universities. So, so the student centered teaching and learning, what we've been talking about, they are really heavily trying to implement it in, in universities as, as well. Yes, um, my name is Sumitra. I come from a, a school, a convent school. Can I bring you down to the early years um, and talk about technology, the use of smartphone and uh, in learning as well as in 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 the uh, recreation or whatever? Is there a policy, a guideline for families and for schools? in the use of IT for your young students. Thank you. Thank you. Again, this would be a topic for a five day seminar. <laughs> and um, we, we try to open it a bit. And um, in Finland, we, we got the new curriculum framework 2014 and the implementation started this academic year. So the schools had uh, two years time to prepare. And, and make planning accordingly. And the new curriculum framework emphasizes the need of the school to utilize technologies in education in an integrated way, which means that we don't teach technology or ICT as subjects, but, but they are embedded to any subject in all levels of education and the teachers need to be technology literate to be able to, to integrate the technologies, not the existing ones, but also the coming ones. And that's a huge challenge for our teacher education and, and also uh, in-service training that, that is uh, facing us now. So we don't have the very clear solutions, but we have national guidelines, we have the desire and we have the principles of how we should consider technologies as a tool and mean for learning, not uh, as an independent subject or topic or, or we don't utilize them because of technologies, but because of they are enhancing learning. And, and this is the mindset that, that we need to learn that it's not technologies because of technologies, but because of, of learning and, and how to use them in a purposeful way. And related to that, there is also a new topic brought to Finnish education now, which is coding. We need to start coding, um, teaching coding for our students from grade one. So that's also quite challenging, but this is one answer in our society of how we want to tackle the future labor market needs. We have quite a heavy forecast, national forecasting process of what the future labor market is, what our companies and employers need after five years, 10 years, 15 years, because we need to start the preparation now to have the, the competent uh, and skilled workforce later on. And for example, this coding was brought because of these reasons, but, but as you can imagine, it's, it is challenging existing teachers. Uh, one of the guidelines uh, that rules all of our comprehensive education, meaning uh, years from one to nine, is that it needs to be completely 100% free of charge for the families which means that the school needs to provide the technology that the students utilize at school. Uh, the school cannot expect the students to, to bring their devices to the school, but uh, since most of the Finnish students from early years on, they have got their own mobile devices. Most of the teachers, most of the schools are utilizing, uh, of course, uh, with the parents' permission, uh, the, the students' mobile devices for learning purposes. So, so uh, if there are own devices, they can be utilized, but if the teacher requires all the students to have a mobile device, the school needs to provide the devices. And the mobile devices, meaning uh, tablets and, and, well, tablets mostly, uh, they are becoming more and more uh, regular uh, in all of the Finnish schools. But the ratio yet is not one to one. I mean, not, not as many uh, devices as there are students. But it's usually a set of mobile devices, a set of tablets than, that then the, the students, the, the classes, the teachers share. 
And it starts in the kindergarten already. So the one and two and three years old, they utilize the tablets at the kindergarten already. But then besides um, learning, um, you know, children can get addicted to the use of that. Is there a help uh, for families or guideline for schools? Uh, research back. <laughs> Did I lose? No. Um, that's a good question. And, and actually, we, we forgot to mention something that is, again, quite specific in Finland, because we think when we talk about technology and education, that it's not me and my device. It's we and our devices. And, and we don't want our children just to focus on the device and what's in it and what's happened inside once head but we want devices to connect the student uh, into the learning environment and with the co-learners and 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 specifically how teachers use the devices this is the way to do it so so it's to socialize through devices uh, and uh, and that's something that we are on the way we are not ready yet so that i cannot write a book of it yet but uh, but maybe later on we can make the guidelines or kind of a handbook of of how to do it and what are the best practices but but the, the mindset is is there that uh, it's it's again following the conception of learning in finland which is learning with each other and from each other uh, rather than just me building and constructing my knowledge and quite many times the students are more ad advanced in their technological knowledge than teachers and as a teacher that wants to utilize technology in the classroom, I have to accept the fact that I quite often need to go to the student to ask, please, could you help me with it? <laughs> and the students are very eager to help and even teach the, the items to the rest of the class. The younger generation, quite often they are ahead of teachers. Right. May I also ask a question? <laughs> well, I am a, a full-time lecturer and a part-time IT geek. So I, uh, I teach interpreting and I've been utilizing uh, VR goggles, so virtual reality in my classes. And uh, so basically I, I try to shoot a video in 360 and uh, I try to recreate or uh, simulate the experience that, the intense experience that interpreters often, often have to encounter. So uh, I wonder if, if Finland has uh, utilized such technology yet. Uh, I'm quite lost a little bit because it's very new, especially in Thailand. Uh, so that is my question. Thank you. It's a very specific question, <laughs> and uh, and and uh, definitely this is the area that that I don't know that much at all. I'm not sure about you. I'm just hoping that that uh, my colleague Pasi would be here, not not the Pasi that we met, but but uh, the Pasi that this guy's a technology educator. <laughs> But, but, but we can try to seek the answers and, and connect you with, with someone if there is any, anything going on. Uh, I have the pre-assumption that in Aalto Yliopisto, which is the, the Aalto University in Finland, which is very advanced in, in, in this kind of te technology integrations and the technical universities, they probably have something like this and, and, and going on. But if there is anyhow we can help you to connect, we will. Thank you. Uh, any other burning questions? <laughs> uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, I'm a doctoral student in language and communication at NIDA. And this question might be a little bit off topic, but tutoring services have been a big issue in Thailand. And so I was wondering if Finland has the same problem because students here in Thailand, high school students, they have to go to tutoring school after you know after regular school time in order to get to a good university yeah. that you. is something that does not exist in our country yeah. <laughs> well it it does after the upper secondary school yes there are some uh, providers that provide preparation courses for universities, but it is a very minor issue and before the end of upper secondary school before the end of year 12, nobody does home tutoring, nobody. 
and and also what we tell to our parents that that it's enough that you support learning we will take care of the teaching you don't need extra teachers just support the learning at home and the learning assignments and and follow that the, the student has uh, enough food and sleep we will take care of the rest mm -hmm. so building trust is very important in the yes yeah. yes Hello. Um, hi, my name is Ari from uh, NIDA as well. Uh, I'm teaching over there. My question is, uh, from my teaching experience, I find it very difficult to get faculty members to work together. Mm -hmm. So you were talking about collaboration. So um, I wonder, from your experience working with Thai teachers in Thailand, Maybe you can recommend something. Um, I find that <laughs> um, because um, I'm not talking about getting faculty members uh, into a formal meeting. I'm talking about working together with good spirits. Um, if you can uh, recommend a ways to do that and how you how you can do that successfully in Finland, that would be great. Thanks. <laughs> First of all, uh, collaboration needs to be voluntary. So you can't force collaboration. The management cannot decide that, yes, now we start collaboration and you two work together, you two work together and you three work together. Do it. That would not work. Uh, the best way to start collaboration is to find somebody who is willing to collaborate with you and who you think it's quite easy to work with. So those are the best initiatives for collaboration. To search for somebody, start with a small project. Don't do it big. Start with a small project, find somebody who wants to collabor collaborate with you, and of course, search, search for the pr uh, permission from the administrators if you think that you, you need the permission. And quite often, when a small group, a pair, starts working together, it raises interest. The others get interested on what are you doing, Quite often, it raises success. Uh, the students are usually very much motivated in teachers working together, because usually it means uh, a different kind of teaching. And when somebody starts it with a small project, according to my experience, it starts spreading around. Your colleagues will start coming to you, hey, what are you doing? Tell me a little more about it. And then you need to be the forerunners in a way that you share the message around. So, so that is how I think the best collaborative, collaborative projects have started with initiative from the teachers, voluntarily uh, from, uh, with colleagues and with the permission of, of the administrators. And, and uh, I've seen many places where finally most of the teachers have been in a way or another collaborating with, with, our, with each other with time. Uh, my name is Alisara from Gasset University. I wonder if you emphasize t uh, testing and grading for the primary school students, because I've heard that there is no testing for kids in Finland, and I think that's wonderful. And the, the, the second question is, uh, what do you expect from the primary school kids? I mean, not academically, what, what are the things that you expect them to be? Uh -huh. Um, you are you are so right saying that we don't have any national testing. 
But we have a lot of tests for our primary students, even on daily basis. And, and that's the difference, because our teachers, they track students' performance really on daily and weekly basis through a school management system. They communicate to the parents even on daily basis of the performance. Uh, so, so there is a lot of testing really, probably more tests than in any other schools in the world, but they are not national. And in this sense, when Elise is talking about testing, it does not necessarily, and most of the times, it doesn't mean a written test uh, with questions that the students are answering. So more than testing, we might talk about assessment. And the teacher, one more time, is in the core of designing how he or she wants to test the students. Right, and, and all this assessment that, that, that uh, Dina nicely changed the concept from testing to, to assessment, we still need to add one more element, which is self-assessment and self-reflections. That's integral part of, of our testing, so God. And, and all this assessment is made against the national standards. So we don't have standardized tests, but our teachers, they know by heart that what they need to achieve as per terms. And when they plan the assessment for their group, it's designed against the national standards. So, so that, that's a kind of a different and difficult mindset to think about it, but basically our students are continu continuously assessed against the national standards, though they are not tested through standardized national tests. It's, it's a kind of a difficult um, concept to think about, but, but having been living it through as, as a student, as a mother, and as a teacher, uh, I, I truly believe that, that it's quite a effective model. And if as a teacher, I can make sure that the student and the parents and me as a teacher, we can know enough of the student's performance without written tests. I don't need to carry out any written tests in my classroom. So the purpose of the assessment is that the student, number one, the parents and the teacher know what the student's progress is. And the teacher is to figure out how to find out about that and then how to communicate it to all the parties. It doesn't need to be a written test and it doesn't need to be the same test for everybody. If there are 25 students, there can be four, five, six different ways to evaluate uh, the student's progress. And the main purpose for this is to guarantee that, that when the student graduates or, or ends the class, the standards are met. And why teachers, they need this continuous assessment from uh, week one is that they need to be able to do early interventions. If they see that one of the children is, is about to drop uh, from the group, there needs to be additional support. And, and so the teacher cannot wait till the exam weeks to, to see what is the level of, of the child. So, so that's why this kind of a proactive assessment and, and evaluation is encouraged so that this is how we can then put the supporting mechanism in place. Thank well, you. come doctor. There's one, one more question that she asked. We need to answer her second question about the primary students and, and what they need to uh, master during their primary years, uh, not talking about the academics. Um, these are not in, in, an, in an order now. I'm just saying some things and Elisa, you can, you can add to this. Yeah. Uh, first of all, they need to be responsible of their own behavior. They need to be responsible of their own studies and they are at all times learning to be the owners of their own learning process. They need to take care of the homework, uh, preferably individually, or if it's a group task, then with the peers, but it's not the parents' task to take care of the students' homework, it's the students' task. Uh, they, socially, they need to be able to work with anybody in pairs, in groups, 
um, they they need to. Um, I'm thinking of the uh, kind of cognitive skills, but it, it goes to more academics then. Mm -hmm. Elisa, what do you want to add? Nothing at this point. Yeah, those are the most important skills for a primary student to achieve. Any questions to Dr. Pasi? It's your turn. I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ride. I recommend it. <laughs> well, um, everybody knows that um, Finnish education is based on the concept of equality. My kids are working, but I think I'm loud enough. Um, Finnish education is based on equality and quality of education. I quality of education so um and i heard i've heard that um you don't have national standardized test at the secondary level yeah and if you do it's meant to to make sure that most students stick around the same area that you you, you have kind of the same quality to all yeah so you don't want to to leave children behind any children behind so um so you try to eliminate the gap between the highest you know the 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 best perform performing students and the poorest one as you don't want to to call them so what about at the university level that kind of mentality does that kind of mentality apply at the university level and what about research excellence if you say that at a university level, you, you aim for research. Uh, Dr. Passi is to uh, answer this, but, but uh, one thing that I want to correct, we are not trying to eliminate the gap between the lowest and the highest performers. Uh, if the lowest performers are here, yes, we want to raise their standard as close as uh, they can up to the, well, the, as, as high as their best performance is. But the high performers, they can go as high as they can. So the sky's the limit or whatever with the high performers, but the low performers, yes, we are trying to keep everybody with. No child is left behind. And then the university level I give here. <laughs> okay, thank you. There was quite a bit of traffic, I can tell you, <laughs> I could otherwise. Um, let, just one comment to this uh, excellent question about clo closing the gap um, in, in Finland. I think one distinction that I see, uh, if, you, if you compare, f for example, Finland, how we see the students' performance or, or learning, and those interpretations in, in the United States or England, for example, America is very much obsessed with a kind of a kind of a two-dimensional way of ranking students. You are either poor or you're excellent or you're somewhere there in the middle. And that's where all this language comes from that we, you know, we are trying to close the gap or narrow the gap or something like this. But I think in Finland we have the whole idea of achievement is a three-dimensional or multi-dimensional so that it's very difficult to say, for example, what makes a good student or poor student because they can, you can, they can be good in their own way, different ways and that's exactly the reason why we, we try to avoid a kind of a standardized assessments that by by nature of standardization uh, assessment or evaluation will put students in a, one on the same line so that's why i think it's um, what i'm trying to say is that when when we are looking at the students performance we try to broaden the scope of, of looking at what, what the students can do and try to find the areas where they are good at. I don't know if this makes any sense. But your question about research, you know, the Finnish higher education policy is again very different than it is in many other countries that we don't have, we don't consider higher education anything elitist as it is in many other countries. And we don't have those like a top universities at all. The University of Zyvaskula, um, you're both from there, right? Where they come from. And the University of Oulu, where I serve as a board of directors, or Helsinki, where I teach every now and then. They're all equal universities. And they all have their strengths in some areas. But we, we try to kind of avoid 
something like we say that the one university would be better than the others. Of course, they compete a little bit against one another. But from the student's point of view, if you're a student in Finland, you're interested in research, you can go to any of those research universities and you will get good education opportunities to do research and you can go as far as you want to want to go. But, uh, but this, this, of course, leads to the situation that Finland cannot compete with uh, countries like United States or England or Australia, where the higher education system and research system is very different. So, so it's a, we see higher education often as a kind of an extension to, to basic education so that students can, everybody can study as, as, as long as they can. So it's a different, it's a different uh, kind of a perspective to education. Was this the right answer, Tina? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You you look tired, guys. <laughs> you, I, I hope that you were not waiting for me here because I, otherwise I feel bad. But so we might be able to take two more questions. Yeah. Doctor. <laughs> I'm sorry again to be asking another question. Uh, this is a question I've asked Kun Suzanne when I met her in the embassy. And if I can put this question to the three of you. If you had to, if you had to send your children to another country and not Finland, which country would that be? Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's a good question, and um, basically, I have nothing to say to that because of our students, they are so independent that they make their choices without parents. And this is probably what we have been heading to. Um, and as far as the student, uh, they make their conscious decisions. I'm, I'm happy as a mother, and, and, and my daughter, she chose um, Denmark instead of Australia or UK because of a certain program specific reasons uh, she was inspecting really the program structure and and, and all the comp contents and implementation models and and if the decisions are made on on, on, on these considerations uh, I, I cannot say anything more but just go. <laughs> I would definitely, I have two little boys at home, I would definitely like to put them to the Finnish school in Pattaya, in Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> so I could get a good school and a wonderful country and climate at the same time. <laughs> but I want to return, before, after you have answered, I want to return this last question to you um, and just ask you, what, what, what do you think you should do? What do you think is the most important thing in, in Thailand, in your own country, to do like one thing? I, w I would really love to hear that from you before, or some of you before you go home, but where would you put, want to put your children? Well, I, I have a practical uh, answer from the history, something that has, has really happened to this question. Um, we were living in the uh, United Arab Emirates in Abu Dhabi when my son was uh, 16 years of age and, and uh, he finished his uh, IGCS there and uh, we were about to stay I was working there and uh, then he would have continued to the sixth form according to the British system and he was the one that told that mum I'm never going to do that I want to go to high school to Finland so we moved back to Finland for his request and he's now a university student in Finland so so uh, Going back to what Elisa said, that our, our young generation, they're usually uh, brought up to be so independent that they don't ask their parents. Sometimes the parents need to do what, what the young generation Maybe. prefers. <laughs> Maybe but I, I think it's time to go home, I assume, very quickly. But is there anybody in the room who would like to uh, share a little bit? What, what do you think would be the, the, the next, next big thing here in your country to do? Where, where to where to start? Yes, I'm Surin from Valilak University, and I think one of the major things that as educationists in Thailand is uh, are so worried about is or trying to to do their best in promoting is English language learning. And you guys speak English so well, and. Pardon, pardon me for my <laughs> pardon me for my ignorance about uh, Finland, but. Uh, Finnish is your national language. How do you incorporate English into your curricula? 
thank you. Anybody else who would like to say something? What what to do? Hello. Thank you. Um, I think the the major the major issues about Thailand right now is that we have tried to tie up the education system with the the change of the poly, uh, political too much and i think what we need to change is that we 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 should stick with the you know the the policies and we we have to focus more on develop de development of the learners and also the the professional development of the teachers not you know not not trying to change um once that they change they change the minister minister and then the policy change and then that that will be something that you know thai, thai education will not be any um, further you know will not be any improve if we keep changing i think that's that is the one thing that we we need to focus on right, right. okay thank you so much any last words if there's not anybody who wants to speak, can I ask you to, to do a final little Finnish exercise? This is what we always do, Finnish teachers do. I don't know how much you have been doing these things, but we always, before we leave the class or finish the course, uh, uh, end of the day, we ask our students to think about a little bit, what did they learn? What, what, what is the kind of the most important thing that you take with you, home with you? Remember what, what my colleagues were saying about the responsibility of learning is with children, students. So this, this is what we always do. We ask them to think about what did you learn today? What is the most important thing? So this is our question to you right now, is that what did you learn? What is the, what, what is, what is the first thing that you will tell to your husband or wife or your children or your friend when you go home from this wonderful seminar and say, listen, I learned this very interesting thing today. What, what, what is it? You don't need to tell us if you don't want to, but you, you need to tell that to somebody who is near you. Just turn to find somebody close to you and say that, listen, I found this very interesting today. What did you learn? Okay, just one minute and then we stop. Okay, one minute. Finish way, finish method. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yep. May I ask uh, Associate Professor Dr. Damrong, uh, the Dean of Faculty of Liberal Arts, to deliver the closing speech and also uh, tokens of appreciation to our speakers, please. First of all, I I like to answer your questions that what what I'm thinking about that we need to do. The talk today really address a lot of problems that happen in our country. But one of the major concerns is about teachers. That's really hit my heart. I think if we need to change the educational system in our country, that needs to start from teacher. In the past many years, our country, except anyone who would like to be a teacher, they can come to the system and to be a teacher. But I think the best way is we need to screen qualified teachers to be the teacher, not just anyone can be a teacher. As you mentioned, that teacher is profession. Thank you very much, Dr. Parsi, Kaus, Asper, Gina, Essie. I that thank you for your inspiration and challenges. Speaking to inspiration, you you address many things that have that happened in our country, and we could learn a lot from your lesson. One thing that I need to mention about is learning need creator of opportunity learning needs facilitator 
that is teacher. Second about challenges, the challenge that you leave us with today is what we need to learn from lessons that you leave with us from Finland. How are we going to apply the lesson from Finland to make our country have successful education system? Second, I would like to thank uh, the Knowledge Network Institute of Thailand and Axon Education Public Company Limited for being co-host of this event today and make uh, this seminar is very successful. And my thanks would go to the organizing committee who make this seminar very successful. And last, my thanks would go to all participants today. I know that you have plenty of work to do. You have a lot of tiring work from your office, from your school. But this is the job of teacher who would like to see for further training, as you mentioned today. I hope that everyone who leave this seminar room today, you will keep something in mind that your heart and soul is teaching. Thank you. Miss Elise, Elise uh, Trovani. And Miss Tina Mosty. Thank you everyone for coming. ขอบคุณมากครับขอบคุณมากครับขอบคุณมากครับขอบคุณมากครับขอบคุณมากครับขอบคุณมากครับขอบคุณมากครับขอบคุณมากครับขอบคุณมากครับขอบคุณมากคร